almost everybody with some kind of a skin cancer, and if there was enough studies, they would find this on most cancers, they also have a low vitamin D. We would also expect that if the sun is causing cancer, that everybody that gets any kind of cancer, or specifically a skin cancer, that they should have sky-high vitamin D and sky-high DHEA. That's not true. I don't use sunscreen. We've had a lot of people come onto the podcast and mention that it's probably not beneficial for people. I can say with 100% certainty, you don't want to wear sunscreen. If you get cold, you double the surface area of your skin to capture sunlight. You rewind and explain that again? Because yeah. what? what? <laughs> everybody has, oh, I guess not everybody. All men have prostate cancer. What? Let's start oh, no. there and then we can go from there. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, for the most part, yeah. Even us sitting all here, we have some level of cancer cell. Hopefully it's not going to turn into a, some kind of a cluster of cells. Then that's detectable right now. That becomes what clinically would be called cancer. But yeah, for the most part, every night you're going to clear some cancer cells. That would be ideal. That would be hopefully what your body does every single evening when you go to bed is clear some kind of cancer cell. I'm just going to move this a little closer to okay. you. Um, and that can be hindered or helped by some of your daily actions. Um, some of those daily actions that will be positive is being in, in the environment in general, right? Like that's the easiest way to kind of catch everything, but it's as simple as get more sunlight or get more cold, depending on where you live. And those things will set you up in the morning or during the day so that your body actively understands what cells it needs to get rid of. We can get into a little bit of detail on kind of how that works, but I, I want to finish that thought. The next part of that is nighttime, right? Because we don't just live during the day. We have night and day. Light absence at night is the triggering mechanism to start the recovery process, right? And we all kind of understand that in the lifelong endeavor of trying to get more jacked. Hey, I grow at night, right? And it's not just growth. It's also dismantling things that you've broken during the day. So absence at night is the triggering mechanism for that absence of light at night. Sorry. So habits in the modern world is the only time when you actively have to think about these types of things. Right. And, and, and I just mean like with electricity and artificial light in general, that's one of those things where, you tend to get away with doing things that normally wouldn't happen and your biology gets confused, right? Because it, there are times when you don't want to get rid of cells. In fact, in certain parts of your body, getting rid of cells would be detrimental, like your brain, for example. You don't want apoptosis to happen at, at the cellular level in your brain. So your, your body tends to be really selective about how it restores itself. The selection process happens during the day. That selection process happens when UV light and infrared light are present at the skin level because what that does is it creates nitric oxide. Now, we all kind of know what nitric oxide here is as far as getting a pump with the gym yeah, and all that type of stuff. And, and so it's a vasodilator, right? That's what it's famous for anyway. Mm -hmm. But it, there's also a unique component in there. It has an oxygen molecule in there that attached to nitrogen instead of by itself. And we all know that oxygen is crucial for living systems. Anybody that has mitochondria, oxygen is crucial. Nitric oxide gets interwoven into the oxygen transfer of creating ATP. When it does that, nitric oxide can't create ATP and can't create water. And so it essentially... It's almost like a molecule that gets in there and stops you from creating energy momentarily at the mitochondrial level. So think of it this way. If you have a car, right, a fleet of cars, right, because you have a lot of mitochondria, you have a whole fleet of them. Um, and your job is to keep them running tip-top shape, right? You run some kind of a chauffeur service. Well, would you... Would it, would it make sense to monitor anything other than the engine of the car, right? Because if you monitor the engine of the car, your, your car is always going to give you 
fuel efficiency. It's always not going to break down, not going to leave you stranded. So you would want to monitor the engine somehow. And as soon as the engine starts to get a little bit faulty, even if it still works, it would be worth your money to just replace it with a new engine or a new car altogether. So your fleet f runs flawlessly, right? Downtime is detrimental. <clears throat> so nitric oxide in that system temporarily stress tests stress tests the engine. So in a car, you would take this to a tuner shop, right? And you'd hook up the car to a bunch of sensors and you rev that engine almost a red line and you really figure out what, what is the engine doing? Is Every it single time the car is totally fine when it's at the mechanic <laughs> and then you drive it off the lot and it blows up. Right. So they need better <laughs> sensors, right? They need better sensors. Okay. So nitric oxide temporarily reduces the mitochondria's ability to create energy, which is what we want. If it's faulty below a certain marker point, the mitochondria releases certain proteins that mark that mitochondria or that cell as being flagged for replacement or repair. Because during the day, UV light and infrared light go in a cyclical manner. So in other words, the morning is mainly infrared, then it goes to infrared with UVA, and then infrared with UVA and UVB, and then backwards to the and, and disappears. No light at, at night. So during the day is the stress test process that marks certain cells to be recovered and regenerated at night when light goes absent. And that's basically the stress test mechanism that you want to focus on. You want to make sure that you make nitric oxide, and the more nitric oxide you make, the more cells you're able to stress test and the, the harder you're able to stress test them. And anything that doesn't survive that test then gets marked for recovery and, and replacement later that evening. So getting sunlight could be something that could be really beneficial to help against cancer. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, in fact, it is one of the main mechanisms that biology has evolved to try to diagnose which cells to get rid of and which ones to keep. Now, Does that maybe explain some way of uh, explaining people with very, very fair skin can have a lot of adverse reactions to the sun um, and sometimes even end up with, maybe I'm not just saying this right, but maybe end up with even like a skin cancer? Well, let, let's talk about that. Because they're not, they're not conditioned to the sun at all? Yeah, yeah. They, and I, and yeah, that, that would be an accurate way to state it. And, I, and then I'll, I'll take this even a little bit further because we actually have data on this, right? Almost everybody with some kind of a skin cancer, and if there was enough studies, they would find this on most cancers, um, you'll find that it's correlative that they also have a low vitamin D. Now, forget about what I just said as far as studies. If I just said that sun causes cancer, but we also know that sun creates vitamin D and sulfates cholesterol to turn into your sex hormones, we would also expect that if the sun is causing cancer, that everybody that gets any kind of cancer, or specifically a skin cancer, that they should have sky-high vitamin D and sky-high DHEA. That's not true. That's literally the opposite. Most that get some kind of melanoma have deficient vitamin D and deficient DHEA. That doesn't, that doesn't line up. Like it's like... Uh, what I want to say is stop thinking that the study answers the question. The study just elucidates the situation. So now you got to think critically about, okay, well, if that doesn't make sense, then what is more likely to make sense, right? Why is the cancer's cells that are supposed to be cleared not getting cleared? And that comes back to what I explained at the very beginning, right? Um, so just kind of leaving that there to kind of chew on as far as it doesn't make sense that less sun will be helpful. But what do we know about training? The more stress you impose, the more adaption happens, right? If I tell you that you're going to do 100 bicep curls today, you haven't done any bicep curls in a long time, you I'm know so the outcome, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> so if I tell you, hey, don't go out in the sun, put on sunscreen every time you go outside, wear sunglasses all the time and cover up, and you happen to forget to do so for a day or two, 
that skin's going to get messed up. And now you've actually damaged it much deeper than it would normally be able to be damaged if, if you would have disobeyed that, that, that first order of put on a bunch of sunscreen, always cover up, don't go outside very often without. Maybe the advice for the sun should have been get some small exposure to it when the sun's not at its peak. Correct. Something like that, right? Absolutely. And then build up legitimately your solar callus. That's a real thing. In fact, paler skinned individuals will actually form a solar callus. You'll notice that their skin almost rougher is not the right word, but it becomes almost like a thicker. Mm -hmm. Whereas darker skinned people, the skin doesn't change as much, but the level of darkness changes dramatically. Oh yeah. Right. So those are two different adaptions because you two, you have two different epigenetics going on there. I think we might need to see his uh, actual skin tone. I don't know, I don't know if I can get it on camera. <laughs> you want this man to pull out his ass cheeks again? <laughs> like he already did that in the gym. Why has he got to do it in here too, Doug? Oh, I missed out. I know, that's what I'm saying. You missed out. The whole audience missed out. If you guys don't know, I mean, if you're watching, David is actually not this color. <laughs> well, he is this color, but his but base color is. is lighter. Yeah, quite Much a bit. Much lighter. He's gotten a lot of sun. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. That's why I was wondering earlier, because we, as we were talking about sun, I'm like, this man is either super tan or, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah. That's awesome. But, but yeah, so the two different adaptions, depending on your epigenetics, right? I have genetics that come from more equatorial mm. standpoint. So when I get out in the sun, I don't form so much of a solar callus. I just get much, much darker. Whereas somebody of your particular epigenetic, when you get more sun, you might find that certain parts of your skin, especially around joints and stuff like that, knuckles, things of that nature, the this, this skin gets a little bit thicker because you're forming a solar callus mm. there. Is there any benefit, by the way, to sunscreen? Like I have... I don't use sunscreen. We've had a lot of people come onto the mm -hmm. podcast and mention that it's probably not beneficial for people, but there's still a lot of people that like will lather that up before they go outside because yeah, let's, let's talk about so. that. This, this could be interesting. Um, almost all sunscreens mm -hmm. at some level interfere with tyrosine uh, being broken down into molecules that you'll know when I name them. Okay mainly melanin. We know that. That's why it's being used as sunscreen. Mm -hmm. But it also stops the creation of, of dopamine, noradrenaline, and adrenaline, and the creation of your thyroid hormones, mainly T3. Tyrosine is the backbone amino acid that converts into all of those. Okay. So if you put something on your skin or your surfaces that inhibits the breakdown of tyrosine, you're not just inhibiting the creation of melanin, you're inhibiting the creation of all of these downstream neurotransmitters. So just saying that, I can say with 100% certainty, you don't want to wear sunscreen. If you are training your skin, the thing you want to use is clothes and shade. And what you said is probably probably more important than those is there are specific times of the day where you run zero risk of creating any skin damage. And that's the first three hours of the day and the last three hours of the day for most places, geographically speaking, right? mm -hmm. latitude wise. Um, Let's say you're going to go to the beach with your kids or you're going to go to a, an amusement park or something. Mm -hmm. Maybe there would be an application of some sunscreen at that point. I would rather Back use clothes. Nose. I would. Okay. I, would ra I would rather you use clothes. Uh, to, to, to tell you the mm -hmm. truth, I would rather you just be like, "Nah, wear a hat for that." Right. I, especially if you're very sun sensitive, right? So everyone's just sitting there on the beach with a hoodie on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and 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 again, that's that's one of those things where I'm not saying I, I'm literally saying you want to eventually get to the point where you're like in SEMA or or even you, right? Most of the time when you go outside, you don't probably need to wear much of anything. No. no. Right? That is where you want to be eventually, right? Not everybody starts there because they've just been told something that's not true, right? 
they're atrophying their skin's ability to do the thing that it naturally does. And if you're working up to it, that's when things like wearing more clothes at certain times of the day is definitely what you want to do. Using shade. Yeah, uh, things under an umbrella or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I would not, from the chemical standpoint, use sunscreen. Not because it doesn't protect you from the sun, but because of all these other downstream effects that will eventually lead to neurotransmitter problems. And on, on that kind of line of thought, because tyrosine breaks down into all these products, mm -hmm. right? I mentioned some big ones there, thyroid hormones, dopamine, neuro, uh, neuroadrenaline and adrenaline, melanin, and any of these can go backwards in that creation process or forwards. So if you understand that correctly, the more melanin you have, the more dopamine you can create. The more dopamine you have, the more melanin you create and vice versa. That is dictated by the oxygen state in the system. Meaning, if you have a crappy aerobic system, you could potentially run into mild hypoxia. I know that you've probably heard about this with dealing with uh, like uh, sleep apnea and things mm -hmm. of that nature. Yeah, sleep apnea. So that's a chronically. Hypoxia is? Just low oxygen at the cellular level, right? So if you have hypoxia, what you're actively doing is you're moving from, ty instead of moving from tyrosine downstream to all these neurotransmitters, you're actually going backwards the other way. So you're breaking down dopamine or melanin or neuro, or, uh, uh, adrenaline or noradrenaline into your thyroid system because what's what's more important that you feel good or that your metabolism is running good your metabolism is running well right so it's always going to prioritize thyroid system first if you have excess of those so when you are in a low oxygen state it will start to break down your melanin or your dopamine or your noradrenaline into some of your thyroid hormones to make sure that you can survive an event because normally we come, evolutionary speaking, right, from millions of years of adaption, right? So there has been hypoxic events in our history. Mm -hmm. There has been low sunlight events in our history and cold events in our history. We have genetic toolboxes, genetic tools in our genetics that help out with those by doing these quirky things that I just spoke about when those are induced. So in modern living, when you have hypoxia, it's going to induce things that will help you survive. Some of those things are positive. We view them as positive, making sure that your thyroid hormones are, viewing, are working correctly. Some of those we view as negative. Oh, it's taking away from my dopamine and I feel like crap, right? So you got to understand that it's trying to get you to survive. It's not trying to keep you happy. And those are some of the events that, that will happen in that particular situation. Another thing that is hypoxic in nature is not being out in the sun. I'll describe it. Melanin charge separates water, right? So some of you might have kids that are in school or things of that nature, or even know about this, but if you take water and you put an electrode in it and you charge it up with electricity, it will make oxygen, right? Everybody like hydrogen cell fuel cars, right? Yeah. Okay. But the byproduct from that's uh, hydrogen, which is going to be used for fuel, mm -hmm. and the other one's oxygen. So it's charge separating the hydrogen from the oxygen. Melanin also does that. So when sun hits your melanin sheets, even if you're a, uh, a light-skinned person, you have melanin. The only people that don't have melanin are albinos. Okay? So when, when sun hits your melanin sheets on your skin, in your eyes, on your hair, it charge separates hydrogen from oxygen. So you're getting free oxygen at the cellular level, at the local tissue. So if I stuck my arm out a window and got sun, my local tissues there will have higher oxygen states than the tissues that are indoors not getting sun. Okay. At, at, because people don't really get told this or anything, but, and then, you know, there really wouldn't be a reason to kind of think about this, but how does the oxygen get to your cell? Like, is there tubes that send it there? Is there, right? Like, nobody really kind of sees that. They just are like, well, I don't know. My lungs get oxygen. I'm like, yeah. And then that goes into your blood. 
and that your blood kind of touches everything, but how does the actual oxygen molecule get to the mitochondria and then create water and CO2 and ATP? It's magnetism. So if you know a little bit of mitochondria, everybody will at least understand that it's the powerhouse of the cell. First thing that comes to mind. <laughs> right? Um, what you, the other thing that you might know is that there are these things called cytochromes, right? One, two, three, and four. They break down your food into electrons. And then at the end of that, there's number five, which is the ATPase. And that's the thing that's spinning, right? It's the, AT, it's the nanomotor that's spinning and creating ATP. On the other end of that, it's also folding proteins, okay? So um, maybe you've heard of like misfolding proteins, especially with like Parkinson's disease and things of that nature. Well, that's what's happening there. That's where the misfolding is happening. The ATPase is now folding them correctly. But let's step back just a little bit about what I said about magnetism. Anytime, some, anytime something spins, it creates a magnetic field. Think about the earth. The earth has a magnetic field it's because it's spinning. Think about uh, an electric motor. When it spins, it's going to create an electromagnetic field. Well, your ATPase is no different. When it spins, it creates an electromagnetic field. Okay? Oxygen is electronegative. So if you looked at it on the peri periodic table, it's the second most electronegative molecule on the periodic table. So, which means that it's going to be attracted to any positive, you know, just like a magnet. If you have a negative magnet and a positive one, it's going to be pulled right to it. That's how oxygen gets to the mitochondria, to where it's supposed to go, which is cytochrome 4, which sits right next to this magnetic field. So if I put my hand out here, oxygen got separated from hydrogen, and now it's saturating the local tissues. And if my mitochondria are working correctly... The ATPase is spinning really fast, creating a nice, positively charged electromagnetic field, pulling in the oxygen locally at all these tissues. If you lack sun, you're going to lack free oxygen. So excess oxygen, that can lead over time to a hypoxic state that can exacerbate or cause more of this sleep apnea. Mm. So you have a hot date coming up and you look in your closet and all you see are the old ugly clothes that you usually wear and you're going to wear tonight. <laughs> it's time to end that, guys. That's why we've partnered with Viore Clothing because they have some amazing athleisure clothes that you can wear in the gym when working out, but also clothes that you can wear on a date or during Hanukkah or whatever. <laughs> you can wear these clothes wherever and they feel amazing. Some of our favorites are the Ponter Performance line, which has Dreamnet fabric, which literally feels so soft on your skin. But they also have this. This is the Rise Tee, also soft, also feels nice and fits great. And they have a lot of amazing clothes that you need to check out to step your fashion game up. We're trying to help you out. Andrew, where can they get it? Yeah, absolutely. You guys got to head over to viori.com slash power project. That's V-U-O-R-I dot com slash power project. And you'll automatically receive 20% off your order. Links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. So essentially you can get free energy is a lot of the stuff that I've heard you talk about. A little bit of what you were talking about there, but on previous podcasts that I've heard that you've been on, it's like free energy, I guess, in a sense, without the calories, without the food. Yeah, and, and this is not, it's hard to grasp this if you have never experienced it. But, you know, some of my clientele do have enough money to do this little experiment, which is, hey, I want you to eat the same food, but I want you to go down to Mexico or somewhere hot, right? Some, some kind of a place like that. And then I want you to try to eat the same amount of food. The very first thing they go is, I don't really feel like I want to. No, like something's different. I, I, I don't feel the need that I need food three hours later, right? Like I'll eat a big breakfast and the next thing I know, I find it pretty easy to make it to three or four in the afternoon when I'm out at the beach or when I'm, and, and that is because you're literally creating ATP without food. And this math has been done. So it's not just me saying it. This math has been done. It's been done by an actual mathematician where they did the math. If you had to, because just so people understand, every day you make your body weight in ATP. Somehow, if you had to eat that amount of food, you would be closer to a gorilla. A gorilla spends most of its day eating, almost all of it. It's because they're also not 
By the way, I'd love to be like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'd kill to be like that. <laughs> yeah. But but at the same time, they'd also don't have bare skin to create this exaggerated effect, mm. right? They're almost all animals have to ha have fur and stuff on the outside, so they don't get quite as a dramatic effect. So they have to spend more time eating, right? And and there's a little bit more to it. We might get into that, but that is a literal an experiment that you can run. Hey, next time I go down south for, for wherever you are, try to eat the same amount of food. You'll find that you tend to under eat just because you forget to eat sometimes because you don't feel that brain fog. You don't feel that urge that, Hey, I'm, I'm lacking some energy, mm -hmm. right? Um, now, depending on how metabolically deranged your body is, that may be significant, or it may be not as significant, right? But it will happen to some degree. Mm. And, and yeah, so that's basically, you know, the way that you want to think of it. It's free energy, but the, the, the reason why it's free energy, just so that I can explain it in a way that, you know, somebody can look it up, is the mitochondria, the ATPase and cytochrome 4, they, they're, they have, they're, their name is cytochrome. Cyto meaning uh, position and chrome meaning color, okay? They have an attraction for red light. Red light allows the ATPase to spin without the input of electrons from food. So red light, and this has been demonstrated, if you look at any red light scientific article or whatever, they say that increases ATP production by creating more ATP. They don't really tell you what it is. I'm just telling you that the fact is it makes it spin faster, mm -hmm. right? Makes it spin faster. So it says if it spins faster, you make more ATP just by it spinning. And when it spins faster, the magnetic field goes up, more oxygen goes, right? So you literally get more energy in that particular circumstance. So when people, cause like we, we've had individuals come on the podcast and talk about like red light therapy devices. Mm -hmm. And especially when we were talking about it in the past, I guess there was research, but still people look at red light therapy and they think it's just kind of woo woo type of stuff. What is happening when somebody grabs and stands in front of a red light therapy device and what benefits will it actually bring? Um, it really depends on the device itself. Mm -hmm. Not all devices have the right light frequency because remember what I said about the red light chromophores at the ATP? They're tuned to a specific nanometer, which is a, a <clears throat> wavelength light yeah. of red. The most beneficial are going to be 650, 850, and somewhere close to those numbers. Some only have one range. Some don't even come close to those range. Mm -hmm. So they won't do much of anything um, specific to, to what I just spoke Can you about. name a brand or two that you would yeah, that you so can think e about? Yeah, your head? yeah. EMR Tech is definitely tested and provides that. And they also provide the second thing, which is enough intensity. Right. Just having the light is not quite enough. And the reason why I can say that is it'll be nowhere near to what you feel even on a winter December day in Wyoming when the sun comes up and it's cloudless. Like even then, you will you even if you were blind, you would be able to feel the heat from the sun, the infrared energy from the sun. And that's really the two markers that dictate whether an infrared panel is going to be beneficial or not. So the little boxes that you can get, they're probably not going to do much when it comes to increasing. Yeah, when it comes to increasing, yeah, just, those are it right there. Again, the really, like those boxes are more for like, hey, indoor living, and I want to make sure that I don't expose myself to too much blue light to downgrade melanin and downgrade dopamine. Mm -hmm. But that big panel right there, yeah, that one. That is legitimately ten thousand dollars. <laughs> that, that is a medical grade infrared panel. Was there. some of this uh, what helped you with your eye, or was that more just like getting sunlight? Oh shit! See, look how big it is, though. Jeez. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. That's, 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 why. that's what I'm saying. It's a full on medical grade panel. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I was like, wait a second, yeah. ten G's, but now it makes sense. Yeah, it's it's really really big, really intense, really really powerful, and. I didn't, I, I just don't have the money to, to spend on something like that. And that's what I want people to understand is that you get way more light than that thing just from the sun. Right. And so that's what I leveraged is the sun. I went as far as even mo like temporarily moving to El Salvador 
And I spent every single day for about 10 hours outside in tan through shorts for seven weeks. <laughs> What's tan through shorts? Yeah. Pull those up, Andrew. <laughs> uh, look up. Those got to look interesting. Look, look up uh, Kaniki, Kaniki swimwear or cool tan. The ladies are, will like them, I think. Tan. <laughs> <laughs> you'll you'll laugh when you see the ones that I they'll be on here. You'll laugh and you're like I I well and maybe you've even seen them on some of my videos. But yeah, because you're doing some of your Zoom stuff on huh? <laughs> pretty much naked. Yeah, yeah, uh, pretty much. Yeah, uh, but but yeah. So I leverage just free free energy. Any any uh, direct like are you looking into the sun? Is there anything you were practicing? No, because you I, mentioned your eye was getting kind of blurry. Yeah, so my my eye was blurry. It had been blurry for a little while. Yeah, I use I use the the trunk version. I uh, use the, you didn't go the speedos. Nah, no, I mean, no, I didn't. <laughs> so why is it called tan through? Like, is, is it's like a mesh? Yeah. So re remember those really popular. You might remember these. The popular mesh. Oh yeah. Yeah. Tank mm -hmm. tops back in the eighties yeah. or whatever. Those it's, came back, by the way. Oh, anyway, in, in some short form. Back. Yeah. People love those. Yeah. Well, that's this <laughs> very similar material, but it's that's a great website. <laughs> <I know. laughs> Damn. <laughs> I got a bookmark. I expect to be so turned on by this podcast. <laughs> yeah. So that's the material that they're basically <laughs> using ones. there. And uh, <laughs> go go to Kaniki Kaniki dot com, and there. They're a UK one. You'll laugh even harder. When How do you spell Kaniki? Yeah, you spell Kaniki, dog. Uh, K or C? Yeah, K. Okay. K I N K. You can't expect them to yeah. be able to spell and know all this other oh, biology and shit well, at the same time. The, 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 right? You'll find this funny. English is my second language. Oh, it's shit. Not, really? it's, it's not even my first language. What's your first language? Spanish. Uh, when did you start speaking English? Not until I was like third grade. Oh, oh shit. Damn. Ooh, we got G strings. Scroll down, scroll down a little bit. Uh, what, why is this man's hands in it? Yeah, I don't know why. Why it's covered it? Or else oh, we would it, see. It says something naughty, uncle. Naughty, bl no blue. I'm not sure what that is. Not, not yeah, it is really weird with the hand inside. Yeah, I don't it's know why. How see through nah, it is. Yeah. This is actually like you see that one with the strap. Like this is the G for, string. Yeah, yeah. this, this yeah. is. Yeah, but All go right. to that top left one right there. That yeah, that one. That, those These are like uh, party under underpants. Yeah, <laughs> so those those are the, those are the ones that I picked the trunk version. But those are the those are the style that I have there, that with all the hilarious. weird crazy designs and stuff. Uh, <laughs> so people really are like, I'm in. Like what the hell? <laughs> like outside my house when I'm I'm doing my work. Like, like I have a I have a desk like this. I, I have a desk. <laughs> you're, in what, you're in that yeah. just like yeah, yeah. <laughs> bulge out and everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean I'm literally at a desk very similar to this out on my yard, taking my Zoom calls, doing my work. I love that my, all this started bucks. with uh, wanting to bench squat and deadlift more. Yeah, it pretty did. much, right? Yeah, it pretty much did. It pretty much you're did. an accomplished power lifter, over 1,900 pound total, nearly 10 times body weight. 198 weight class, I think. Yeah, I, in fact, I got what is that uh, award uh, on uh, the most Jack than Tan? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, yeah. it's on the powerlifting website, the old one. I forget it because now everybody powerlifting goes, watch or something. Yeah, powerlifting watch. That's the one. And there is the the you know the the awards for 10 times body weight total oh, and 11 times body weight total. I got the 11 time body weight oh, total. Damn. Absolutely uh, incredible. I, I totaled 1978 at 193 pounds. Yo. Yeah. yeah. Sick. And That's real. Yeah. And that <laughs> happened in 2020. That's got to be a 700 plus pound squat. Yeah. 733 and a 810 deadlift and a 430 bench. Damn. Yep. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. It, yeah. And that was kind of the cold. That was the last time I competed in powerlifting. Um, I competed in strong. Man. You're like, I won. I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's a hot. I mean, the whole time it was a hobby. Like even up until that point, I was still working a, a regular nine to five job. I was working in the oil field for, you know, 6 a.m. to 4, 4 p.m. every every evening. So it was just a hobby. At that time. But you wanted to figure out how to get the most out of it. And that's how you started to research a lot of this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Research, you know, PEDs, how, how to take them, how to get the most out of them, how to set up my training correctly, how to monitor recovery, all of that type of stuff. It, that was a 10 year journey. Mm -hmm. That was, that was 10 years from when I started until I peaked, you know, my last competition there. I, I probably will still do another one, right? Like I, I don't have like this whole time, you know, cause I was in El Salvador and all that type of stuff. I kind of just put training on the back end and just focused on my business. But it, just in April without any zero training, like I probably hadn't touched a weight in like four or five months. I were, I just wor worked up to a 550 deadlift nice. cold, no, no big deal. Which means that taking some time off 
is not going to be the end of the world. <laughs> Right. That's, I try to tell that to people on that. Even for myself, that's elucidated even more, especially if you've lived a life of enhancement. It's one of those things where mm. you are pretty much, unless you do some really, really atrocious stuff to like mess things up, like just turn into a big fat slob Thor style, <laughs> mm. you're, you're not really going to, uh, uh, detriment very much on that. You're, you're going to move backwards, but only because you're not perpetually moving forwards. Um, but yeah, that's how the whole thing started is just finding people that know more than me and asking a whole hell of a lot of questions, writing them down and then asking more questions and asking where did more he, questions. Do you remember where it started or with who exactly? Like, yeah, yeah, actually. Yeah, I do. Actually. I, I know exactly where I got on Facebook and, I, and YouTube and would try to find most of my information there as far as like. Peep, like not the information that they were talking about specifically on the podcast, but like, what are they actually talking about and who are they? Right. And then try to figure out some way to connect with that person to ask questions directly. Right. Because, and I want to make this somewhat clear, like not all of the information on any podcast is ever going to be applicable directly to your particular situation. That's fundamental when you are trying to learn. It's more about formulating your questions from the information being permitted and then either figuring it out yourself or getting in, talk to, in contact with somebody that actually knows that. And the person that I got in contact with a bit of, with, uh, was Broderick Chavez um, when it comes to the PEDs and things of that nature of n not just how to take them, but what do they actually do, right? It seems like no one ever knows. <laughs> You're like what? What does testosterone do? Like I don't know. It makes you bigger and stronger. We're like, but how? And then where does it come from? Like where are these things yeah. being made? Yeah, yeah. And so yeah, and, and a lot of his stuff, you know, over over the course of you know, there was the obvious. Well, if you take this drug, this will do kind of this type of stuff and this type of stuff. And there's some secondary effects in there. And that's where it started to get interesting. And that's when I started to really find information of like, oh this particular drug will bias towards this particular outcome versus this other drug because of the environmental situation that you put them in, right? So people have to understand that just because I said, you know, that Mastron did this for me, isn't going to mean that it does that for them because the environment you introduce something into matters more than the actual introduction of the drug. Mastron got me super lean. Yeah. Right. Somebody at 25% yeah. body fat that doesn't diet is going to be like, it didn't work for me. That's like, well, you didn't introduce it in the same environment. Correct. Yep. The environment makes the, the, the difference. It makes the complete difference. And in, in just thinking about the, the, the whole conversation that we've had so far, the environment is number one. In fact, Darwin kind of said that, like everybody kind of thinks that Darwin, you know, says, you know, it's evolution, you know, there's this, this trait, is it positive or negative, all that. But they forget that his first iteration of that whole concept, he didn't know about quantum physics and those types of things. Like, how do you actually quantify the environment? But he did say that there's two parts to this. One is the genetic component mm. and the other is the environmental or what he called it is circumstances of existence and he said the circumstances of existence matter more than the genetics he didn't nobody really knew what that meant and so they kind of just left that behind not bad for a photographer <laughs> very true <laughs> yeah very true and so now I can, most people can kind of start to elucidate and it'll be more and more elucidated. Environment matters more because the circumstances of existence dictate how the genetics will respond within that circumstance or within that environment. So that's mainly what I got away from talking to, you know, people like Broderick, people like Andrew Triana, um, that's been on this podcast is the environment makes a huge difference and potentially makes the whole outcome. How does it do so with something like food? Yeah, well, actually let's, let's talk a little bit about that. So most people are not technically wrong, but even Andrew kind of thinks this way is it's not really about calories in or calories out as it's painted by the fitness industry just there's somehow an equation of this is how much food that i can eat 
And if my expenditure is here, it should work, right? That's focus. That's working on a closed system. That's assuming that you don't have an environment that influences the outcome. So now let's talk about what really happens, right? So if I told you that I want you to eat 400 grams of carbohydrates at, at oh, spread over two sittings, right? You go, okay, no problem. I can crush that. No, no big deal. And I told you, I want you to eat it at noon or around the middle of the day. And I want you to do it outside. So you do that. You eat that. You do that perpetually for eight weeks. You're probably going to find that you actually kind of lean out, especially if most of the, your environment is very sunny. You do it over the summer. Now, let's say you do that same, same exact thing. But you do it in the winter and you live somewhere where there's snow. Do you think you're going to get the same response? No. No, probably. I mean, logically, right? Like, you, you, it doesn't take you to be a scientist to understand that that's, that's probably wrong, right? Now, Maybe some of the storage genes are turned on in the colder temperatures and you're not getting the sunlight and so forth, right? Well, people tend to also move less when it's colder. Yeah, th th there's, there's so many variables. Yeah, exactly. The environment changed the outcome. Yeah. Even though you ate the same food the same calories, right? Now, what you said is, at the very beginning, you, uh, or maybe even before we started recording, was, you know, if you, if you have somebody who's already kind of in the trenches and been doing this for a little while, they can quickly understand that there's kind of like some kind of an energy change up there that I got to account for, where somebody who's new to this won't be able to understand it, right? Now, let's take it a little bit deeper when it comes to same calories, right? Those same carbohydrates that you're going to do. Now let's forget about like different season. That's an obvious thing, right? Let's talk about summertime. You eat 400 carbs for eight weeks in, in during the middle of the day for eight weeks. And then eight weeks later, somehow, maybe you live at the equator, right? So it's steady sun, sun, sunshine all the time. Now you eat those same carbohydrates at night because you work a shift job. Right, you wake up at noon and you go to bed at midnight, mm -hmm. and you eat those 400 grams of, of carbohydrates after it's been dark and you're under a, a artificial light. Do you think there's going to be a change? Yes, and I'm gonna I'm gonna elucidate some of those changes. There's a lot more, but there are some of these. Right, blue light has now been actively shown to raise insulin without eating any food. Blue light, like you get it from your phone and TV. Any and artificial forth. light, any Got artificial it. light, right? There's, let's put it that way. Like everybody says blue light, right? So people get myopic about what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Artificial light. If it's man-made, it's going to have a blue spectrum. The only time that it doesn't have a blue spectrum is not legal to get in California anymore, which is uh, incandescent light bulb, an old mm -hmm. light bulb. I'm going to tell you why. A fire doesn't have any blue light. Why? Because it was made from the sun. Because the wood that you're burning was made by sunlight. So when you reverse the chemical process that made that matter, you create the light or the dominant light that made that particular matter. An incandescent light bulb is a fire contained in a glass bulb. So it puts out a lot of red, which is why they get hot, right? Hot to the touch. You don't want to touch those. Um, and why LEDs, CFLs, and fluorescents are more efficient because they've removed that whole light spectrum on purpose to make it more efficient, which left you with only blue. Hmm. Okay. Right? So any artificial light in this modern age will be blue light dominant. Under normal circumstances during the day, blue light really only happens throughout the middle portion of the day. Right, because I, what I said when you're trying to augment the skin's ability to take in, in sunlight, morning and evening are the safest times because there's very little, if any, uh, UV light. UV is a, a form of blue light, right? And then in the very middle of the day is when you're going to get both UVA, UVB, so the most blue spectrum. That also is an environmental input because we're diurnal creatures that there's a whole second half of the day that should be coming, which means if you haven't had food or you don't have shelter, you should get your ass up and you probably should move around and, and figure that out before sunset, right? So it's an adaption to make you more active or try to make you more active. 
and also potentially not being fed, right? Because your, your biology is meant for survival. It's not meant for anything other than that. That means that if you don't have any food, we should provide you enough energy substrates to continue to be active to figure that out, which means your liver stored glycogen, hopefully the day before or that morning or whatever, and it's going to actively release some glycogen for you and raise insulin just by that signal of blue light. Well, what happens when you are going to go to work, turn on all your lights, your artificial lights, and induce that signal? You're going to be more active or alert anyway, not necessarily active in a physical sense, but you'll be more alert. Um, and it's also going to dump glycogen through uh, ACTH and some other hormones that talk to the pancreas and talk to the liver to release glucose and release insulin. On top of that, you're going to eat these 400 grams of carbohydrates, right? So now you can see how quickly you've exaggerated the insulogenic curve. What happens when you eat turkey, turkey dinner, right, for Thanksgiving? Right? That's a lot of tired. Yeah, you get, you get really tired. You end up being really kind of out of whack a little bit mentally, right? Because you've induced a big storage response because it's trying to put you to sleep, right? That's what will happen pretty much every time you eat a bunch of food at night under fake light. So if you chronically do that, what do we also know about the delineator between being able to burn body fat, one of the mechanisms anyway, to burn body fat versus burn glycogen. Insulin, right? Insulin will bias towards stopping uh, fatty acids from being uh, utilized by the cell and bias more towards uh, glucogenesis and all of those types of things. So if you think that you're gonna be able to burn body fat being indoors all the time under fake lining, you're going to find a surprise on that ability because you're, you're blunting it. You might even feel almost starved and you're like, I should be burning a lot of body fat and you don't, you get less and less results, but you feel more and more starved. And it's because if there's fatty acids in the bloodstream, your body's not really going to use them very much. You're going to continually dump more gl uh, liver glycogen into the, into the stream and you're, you're going to feel tired. You're going to feel not that hot. And so that environment changed the circumstance, even with food. So you've gotten your labs done, whether it's six months ago or a year ago, and you want to know where things are at, but you don't want to get a full panel again. That's why I've partnered with Merrick Health, owned by Derek for More Plates, More Dates, and we have something called the Checkup Panel. This is an affordable panel with 55 different labs that'll allow you to see all those different biomarkers. And you can get this channel every month or every two months, whatever frequency you like, but it'll give you all the specific labs that you want to know so that you can make sure that you're moving in the right direction for your specific hormones. Andrew, how can they get their hands on it? Yes, that's over at MerrickHealth.com slash Power Project. And at checkout, enter promo code Power Project to save 10% off the Power Project panel, the checkup panel, or any individual lab that you select. Again, that's at MerrickHealth.com slash Power Project, promo code Power Project at checkout, links in the description, as well as the podcast show notes. How about, um, so like at our house uh, at night, we have like salt rock lamps. So they, <laughs> they, they get warm, but they don't get hot like the old school uh, light bulbs used to and then we have some other like red lights red light bulbs also that mm -hmm. claim to at least have like 99% uh, uh, blue light free um, I'm just curious can you get away with some of the, the modern lighting by uh, we'll just say like putting a filter over it or does it have to absolutely be 100% blue light free no no that you're that is a valid thing to do like mm -hmm. so but again, now you have to go out of your way to do it, right? Like, yeah. whereas before, right, that was, it was ubiquitous uh, as far as like everybody had normal incandescent light bulbs. You didn't really have to worry about the type of light that you turn on at night, mm -hmm. right? Whereas now you kind of do if you don't want certain effects to happen or you do want certain effects to happen. Mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, now I'm not, that doesn't give you, and, and, and it kind of is self regulating. When you permanently, like I, when, when we get done eating dinner, Overhead lighting turns off, lamps turn on, all of them have red light bulbs. 90 minutes later, everybody's ready for bed. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not even really hard to do. Like you, you don't have to wind down kids. I have three kids, right? And they're all 10 years and younger. Most parents actually say the opposite. Most of their kids get wound up at night. Well, 
go back to what I said about blue light and how what it does, you know, evolutionary speaking. It's, yeah, you're going to notice that in their behavior almost immediately. So, yes, even LED bulbs that have a red light spectrum or just party bulbs, I just use cheap, you know, $19 for a pack of six party bulbs, put them in red and lamps. Really? Yeah, yeah. It cool. doesn't it doesn't have to be expensive. Again, you're not getting the ATP production and all that type of stuff from it, mm -hmm. number one, they're not powerful enough to do it. And any light bulb that claims to do that is yeah. I mean, you saw what what kind of panel you're gonna need to even come close, mm -hmm. right? Um, but are they beneficial? Absolutely, because they change the dynamics of the hormonal response that's going on in that environment. So is there anything else that you have set up in the house other than those light bulbs? Is there anything else that you do that you think other people could easily do in where they live? Yeah. The, the next thing, depending on, well, let's step back, back a little bit to the nitric oxide uh, issue, right? Like I talked about how uh, you make nitric oxide with sunlight, right? And then the first thing people are going to say, well, what if I work a job where I can't be outside at that point in time? Yeah. Or what if I live somewhere where sunlight just isn't strong enough? I'm clearly not making nitric oxide. It's pretty, very easy to tell when you do make nitric oxide from the sun because your skin gets nice and pink and you you tend to, your veins tend to pop out and things of that nature, right? Well, we, as mammals, have also evolved mechanisms to live in four seasons, right? So <clears throat> one of those mechanisms that does the same entrainment effect of nitric oxide is cold. Cold is the back door to the biological system that dictates your circadian rhythm and this whole process of cellular function working correctly. Everybody goes, oh, okay, well, how does cold do that? Well, once you've experienced cold repetitively enough for at least about two or three weeks, mm -hmm. you'll notice that every time you get cold, your skin gets pink, very pink. That's nitric oxide. Mm. So in cold environments, mammals have adapted to be able to break down arginine and other nitric oxide products into, ni into nitric oxide itself for entrainment of the circadian rhythm. And... That does the same thing as sunlight as far as marking cells for autophagy and apoptosis for cellular uh, repair and stuff like that. Um, and now we'll get a little bit into how melanin helps get, gets helped by cold. Melanin uh, gets sucked internally when cold is induced to regenerate neuromelanin or melanin that's inside your nervous system. It's also going to mean that your mitochondria now get the signal to create something called ultra-low UV light. You can't see this unless you use a photomultiplier, which they use in science, but bacteria, right? Like, uh, especially now that there's being a lot of more research done on like stomach bacteria and stuff like that, fecal analysis and stuff like that. They use these types of devices to distinguish the, this bacteria from that bacteria. They give off different light okay. as they metabolize things. Well, your mitochondria is a bacteria. So when it metabolizes things, sometimes it releases light. And cold is one of these things that it makes it release. And what I said it, it releases is ultra-low UV light. So what? how does that nitric oxide from cold be in, get, get induced? The mitochondria create UV light that breaks down arginine into nitric oxide. So in sunlight, the UV directly hitting your, your skin creates the nitric oxide. Mm -hmm. In the winter, when you induce cold, it signals the mitochondria to create ultra low UV light that creates the nitric oxide. Okay. So let me ask you this. We were talking in the gym about how when you were in El Salvador, you, you would manipulate like being in the sun and being in the cold and something happened that, like something happened to your eye over time. Hmm. How can people like replicate that? And what do you think happened to you? If you can explain it. What, so I'll just answer the, what do I think happened? Again, this, this is purely anecdotal because I didn't get retinal scans and all kinds of stuff to actually see if it got remodeled or anything yeah. like that. Um, because you would see that in an MRI. You can pick up melanin 
in an MRI, mm -hmm. you, like internally. Um, but what I think happened is I created a crap ton of melanin on my exterior and then periodically shift that with cold at certain points in time to create the, the movement of melanin into the body. And I probably had a deficit of melanin in my left eye and it just made it harder to see with that particular eye. Yeah. Um, I attributed it to just aging, aging in general. But after a steady two weeks of introducing the, uh, the cold, that's when I started to notice, hey, my eye is not as blurry. And now to, to right now, to this day, it's, it's, I, can't, I can't tell the difference really mm -hmm. when I close one eye or it's to the other eye. Gotcha. But other people will know, like, for example, my wife had a acid reflux problem as far as like just continually having to take Prilosec and that type of stuff and to the point where it would come up into her throat and they found out that her esophagus sphincter was not closing all the way and stuff like that. And they're like, oh, you really can't really do anything about that. Mm -hmm. But uh, any sphincter has more melanin than the rest of your body because it has to have a constant electrical flow yeah. to, to, to contract that muscle and keep it contracted. Uh, that's not, you know, most people kind of understand that in order to contract a muscle, you need some electrical conductivity, right? If you have nerve damage, you're not going to be able to move those muscles nearly as well or at all. So it's about electricity. Well, sphincters need to have electricity all the time. And melanin is a great semiconductor, meaning that it holds and disperses energy very easily, like a, like, oh, oh, yeah, just, just like a solar panel does, right? Sunlight hits it, creates electricity. If you have some way to store that electricity, it's gonna, you're, you'll be able to store it, the battery, right? Um, and water and melanin are great storage mechanisms for electrical flow in the body. And she got pretty tan. She got quite tan for, for being white and literally two weeks or less probably. No more acid reflux. No, no more going up into the throat. And even and that was the only change at that time. Yeah, she didn't. She did nothing other than went to El Salvador for three weeks and read a book. <laughs> While I mean, because we didn't, you know, we homeschool and stuff like that. So yeah. uh, the kids just hung out. We weren't teaching school or anything. So you know, other than just making sure that the kids were not drowning in this ocean, <laughs> but the responsibility was pretty minimal. So I mean, she basically got outside, read a book every single day, and you know, we went about to some tourist attractions and stuff like that. Nothing special other than just get really tan, right? And yeah, within two weeks, no no real acid reflux to the point where she didn't have to take her medications, right? In the winter, she would notice it would get worse mm -hmm. to the point where she had to double up on her med or whatever to kind of do that. She hasn't had to do any of that yet. I think, uh, you know, in years past, the way that we would look at performance enhancing drugs would be they're pretty much just steroids. Like someone would use like a steroid cycle in the Olympics and they get busted, you know? Mm -hmm. um, nowadays, it seems to be way different. It seems to be like a steroid or steroid cycle, you know, it, it, it takes a couple of weeks for it to impact you and so forth. But now it seems like there's more things that you can take uh, situationally mm -hmm. that can have an impact on the particular training effect that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you can have a really massive uh, performance enhancement without necessarily, I don't even know if some of these things are banned, but without necessarily uh, being on like a steroid cycle. Um, these, uh, you could, I, I'd imagine like you might have protocols or there might be things that you do or um, that you've come up with for cold therapy, for going outside in the sun. Um, you and I have talked about methylene blue and what that can do, it can kind of turn the body into like a solar panel in a way. Mm -hmm. So like, what are some things that people can do that are maybe like realistic for people to do um, that could be an amplifier of their day? Just a simple 10 minute walk. Is there a supplement or something they could take before they go and do that 10 minute walk? Could they practice nasal breathing? You know, could they... You know, you I'm no, sure yeah, you yeah, yeah. So we'll we'll start to the things that don't require any ingesting ingesting of anything, and then we can kind of layer up on top of that, depending on exactly what you want to do, right? What what I mentioned before about the environment makes the change and makes things happen. When you get that right, then yeah, introducing some kind of a PED of really any kind can have exaggerated effects of what you're trying to accomplish. So let's start with how do you set the environment correctly, right? So. Number one, 
by now everybody kind of understands that getting outside is crucial, right? Experiencing cold or heat from the form of sunlight is crucial. How do we exponentially increase your body's ability to take in that information? Number one starts with your surfaces, right? At this point, we can understand that your surfaces are very important. How do we make them the most robust and the most efficient? Number one is getting enough fatty acids, omega-3s to be specific, DHA to be even more specific. The problem is the pills don't work very well until you're taking a lot of them, like a lot. I mean, you're going to spend $100 a week on enough fish oil pill to accomplish this. My hack for that, especially in America, is canned seafood of any kind. Most canned seafood is illegal to be farmed raised. It has to be caught fresh and it's canned fresh right, right there. It's a really easy cost-effective hack at getting enough DHA, crucial DHA, and the crucial cofactors for it to be incorporated into your cell membranes. DHA is a fatty acid that doesn't get burned for fuel. It gets used for uh, incorporating into cell membranes. Everybody kind of, especially if you're a woman, you, you know that it's incredibly important for brain generation because that's why they put it in all your prenatals and stuff like that to make sure that the baby forms correctly, especially a brain and stuff like that. But for the most part, you have DHA in every single membrane. When you upgrade your cell membranes on your surfaces, DHA is like an upgraded solar panel. You're making it state of the art. Okay. That's why it has that kind of metallic y taste to it is because is there any particular fish like it because I know like mackerel will actually have like a lot of fat grams in it versus mm. tuna or some other yeah, white fish yeah. will have a lot less. Uh for the most part, there any cold water fish will have enough DHA in it. And that's where, you know, personal selection. I personally don't like the taste of, of mackerel, but I like the taste of sardines and I like the taste of of salmon. Right? You ever had herring or sprats? I love herring. Oh, I love yeah. kipper snacks. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just go to an Eastern European store. Y'all find that shit. Yeah. But <laughs> the, but it's crucial. I mean, there's a reason why it's called an essential fatty acid, right? People, I'm, I have yet, because you can get this tested these days. It's called an omega-3 index test. It's just a finger prick and get it tested. Um, and there's a lot of science coming out. When your omega-3 index is an 8% or higher, you are up to 30 or 40% less likely to incur any mortality. This can be included in your blood panel with Merrick Health, by the way. Yep. Mm -hmm. I have yet to see somebody that's not eating in, a, you know, at least, I would say at least five ounces of some kind of seafood semi-daily, so maybe every other day type of scenario. If you're not eating about that much, your omega-3 index is going to come up like at a four or a five. That's kind of the average. Mm -hmm. um, if Even if you're eating like grass, you know, because people will say, you know, there's omega-3s in grass-fed beef and stuff like that. It's not enough. It's not enough. And the reason why is DHA gets destroyed by artificial light and non-native electromagnetic fields like Wi-Fi and cell phones. Mm -hmm. It's there to be destroyed. That's why it's on your surfaces because when it's destroyed by the right type of light, aka sunlight, it turns into something called uh, decosinoids. Decosinoids are there to reinforce cell membranes and repair them correctly for the adaption that needs to happen as far as forming a solar callus that's still permeable to the right wavelengths. When it's broken down by non-native electromagnetic fields or blue light, it doesn't get formed. It doesn't get cut up in the right places, so it can't have that protective effect. But it still gets destroyed. So living indoors in modern life puts a bigger need for the consumption of DHA because you're actively destroying it, but you're not incorporating it correctly into your cell recovery process. Okay. This makes sense? everyone a little bit sad, but what's wrong with farmed fish? Actually, in this particular circumstance, I wouldn't say that there is a lot <clears throat> wrong. It's still better than not getting mm. I will say that with a, like I never discourage anybody from getting even farm raised seafood because the upside is incredibly more beneficial. The the downside, right? Like if you were to kind of put one on it, would be that most of it's going to be fed grains and stuff like that. So their omega three content may be lower. That I mean, that's realistically the downside. Um, 
versus a wild caught fish that's eating algae and all, mm -hmm. every, all the you know all the things that it's supposed to eat, the, which is where omega threes come from. And people, vegans in general, will kind of say, "Well, I get my omega threes from this you know plant based drive thing." The problem is, it's a different position. There's uh, it's called SN one and SN two position. The animal has to change it into that position to be able to be incorporated into mammal cells. The other one won't. Yeah, you're technically in eating it and it's going into your body, but it may not, it probably won't be incorporated into cell membranes because we lack that ability to, to convert it manually inside of us, where it's like fish and lamb. Lamb will convert it. Mm -hmm. So, so lamb also has a much higher amount of. Wow. Shit. Yeah. Much higher amount of what? Uh, Omega threes. Oh, really? Yeah. More, more than beef. More That's than interesting. Beef. Yeah. Because it, it, ha it actually possesses the enzyme to actually convert that oh, itself. Okay. Right. That makes sense. Yep. I want you guys to imagine that you're wearing a cast on your hand and you're going through your whole day with this cast hand. Well, because your fingers don't move, your hand will start to become stiff, weak, and that'll work its way up your arm. That's the same thing that happens when you wear these damn fucking shoes, okay? I'm sorry to curse, but it's frustrating because these shoes that have a narrow toe box, although they look nice in their Nikes, narrow toe box so your toes can't move. They're not flat, so your foot is in this weird thing and it's not getting stronger. And they're not flexible, so they don't move and your foot just moves like this all day, which means your feet are getting weaker. That's why we partner with Vivo Barefoot Shoes. They have a bunch of shoes for the gym and casual shoes, but the thing about these shoes is that they are wide, they are flat, and they are flexible. So your foot can do what it needs to do and it can get stronger over time. That's gonna allow you to be a better, stronger athlete. Andrew, how can they get them? Yes, that's over at vivobarefoot.com slash powerproject. When you guys get there, you'll see a code across the top. Make sure you use that code for 15% off your entire order. Again, vivobarefoot.com slash powerproject. Links in the description as well as the podcast show notes. Throw these oh away. Oh my God. Dude, watch the, watch the camera. What are some other amplifiers? you do anything before you get in the cold? Or is there like, you know, I've heard some people talk about uh, after the cold, they like will work out and get themselves warm you know, via their own body temperature by exercising. Yeah, that, that can work. Um, but the, to, let's put it this way to amplify cold, you, you want a high omega three index. You will notice when you have a high omega three index that when you get cold, you almost tend to radiate heat even faster than normal, huh. like on the, on the after effect, like jumping Because the whole body's more efficient. The mitochondria is more efficient, right? And so you yep, cell membranes are more efficient mm -hmm. and all of that type of thing. So now the information was that much more well received by the whole system and knows exactly what to do next, right? Um, then I will say on the flip side of that, cold will make it even more efficient to get sunlight. So just a cold bath, cold exposure outside, and then immediately step outside. If the if even in the winter, right? Like uh, I even take this to the point where if it's a if it's a cloudless day. Right, because not in the winter it's not always snowing. Right, there's sunny days. It's just the sun is so far down on the angle that it's not going to melt the snow. But there's still sunny outside. If you get cold, you double the surface area of your skin to capture sunlight. You rewind and explain that again. Because yeah. what? What? <laughs> So a lot of shrinkage happens. <laughs> I'm thinking double in the size. What is he talking about? <laughs> let's, let's put it this way. Because I was trying to envision that in my mind as you yep. say it. I'm so like, here's, here's, here's this surface area, right? Whatever inches across, inches down, right? Uh -huh. If I take this and now I go like this, okay? Now I can put a second one. I can put a second one right here mm. in the same area because I've made this bump on it. Okay. What's a goose bump? Mm. Uh, mm. It's what? You're trying to get warmer? No, your goose bump is this. Boop. Oh, you've literally, your skin was flat. Your skin was flat. Mm -hmm. You got cold. It made boost goose bumps. Now every single square inch of your body has twice as much surface area. Oh, shit. <laughs> it's, it's physics. This is just, yeah. So, okay. So that means if like, if you get cold and then you go out into the sun, you'll be able to capture more. Mm -hmm. be huh. Is there a... Do you, is there a temperature of how cold you need to get? Could you just go take a cold shower and then go outside? Or Whatever gives you goosebumps. goosebumps. Yeah, that, that, gives you goosebumps. For, for that particular instance, anything that gives you goosebumps will do that. Now, 
Good. Keep your cold plunge at yeah. 60 degrees. Yeah. I'll, no, I'll bump so, that shit up to 70 and I'll still get goosebumps. Yeah. How about that? Well, I will say this. <laughs> the, the, the nitric oxide effect, right? Like of the mitochondria getting the correct signal and then producing its own light. That starts at 60 degrees. Sold. I'll keep, I'll keep it at 60. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. So does it need to be colder than that? No. Um, if you want to be more aggressive or you have something that you're trying to fix or something along those lines, yeah, yeah. you can take it as far as you want. Trying to prove a point. Yeah. <laughs> Send a message to everybody. Put yeah. everybody on notice. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Uh, I mean, for me, I mean, I'm basically just, you know, I live in Wyoming, so it'll be negative degrees in the middle of summer or I mean in the winter, in the middle of winter. I just put a bag of magnesium in my water so it doesn't freeze. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's going to be 10 degree water Ooh. or whatever. <laughs> but again, the point is I just want to get in there to send the correct signal. I just want to get pink. Like, so when the water is 59 degrees, mm-hmm. it might take me 20 minutes to get to that point. When the water is 10 degrees, it might take me three minutes to get to that point, right? Like if you know what you're looking for, you adjust the, the prescription because the environment makes the difference right? yeah right and so so yeah so the again so going back to little hacks right uh if you live somewhere where you just can't accomplish great sunlight exposure or you just don't have the time to really get more of it well set aside at some point where you can exponentially increase that type of interference or that that that, that type of effect that type of gathering effect another thing that you can do is a mirror right a mirror uh a, a white building uh window, anything like that on the backside. So you're facing the sun or vice versa, right? You're facing the building because now that's going to reflect back all the solar energy on the opposite side of your body. And if you're cold, now you're quadrupled the surface area that's interacting mm. the, the, with, the, with the sun. So hack number one, get enough omega-3s in you to raise your omega-3 index at least to around eight. Hack number two, learn to use cold and sun together and it, that gets compounded by the lighter skinned you are and the less sunlight you get. You need more cold. Okay. Then another hack that you can do is depending on when it comes to performance enhancing, right? For, uh, you can literally induce it, what that little, uh, you know, sequence of events that you elucidated of, I'm going to get cold then I'm going to go work out. That particular thing will work great for enhancing neural drive and dopamine drive because uh, maybe a little strength improvement there will there will be a bump in that because some of the downstream effects of getting cold and in, and inducing this uv light is the production of more dopamine and noradrenaline because it's a it's a minor hypoxic state what did i say about hypoxia hypoxia is not a bad thing hypoxia is a, an adaption to a stress response so when you induce hypoxia chronically, like you do a little bit of cold, do do a little bit of uh, br- uh, breathing, like breathing technique. Like I'm, I'm, ta- I'm not talking about like in and out meditation. Maybe a little Wim Hofish or something. Yes, so yes, you're yes. Breathing kind of fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or what I cold. like to do is uh, any type of training that has to do with deep sea diving, like free diving. Mm. Okay, because what you're doing is you're inducing hypoxia and you're training the body to re- work through a hypoxic state. And in order to do that, you have to dump melanin into dopamine, dopamine into noradrenaline, and adrenaline into and or ad- dopamine into adrenaline, and then adrenaline into nor- noradrenaline. That so, kind of breathing requires you to breathe out quite a bit, right? Mm-hmm. You're trying to blow off a lot of CO2, mm-hmm. blow off quite a bit of that, mm-hmm. and then you know, big deep breath. And then in order to train, like that's the, doing that will induce the response. But how do you make the response bigger? That's by training really, really, really deep, only nasal breathing, and then cyclically running that through so that you're creating a hyper oxygen state. And then you do that for like five minutes and then you hold. And you hold for as long as you can. I've gone five minutes. Just holding your breath? Yeah. So what what did you do first? You said you were- Just nasal breathe. Just nasal- And you each, do that for five minutes. Yeah, you do that for about five minutes. And what you want to do is you want to make sure that your mouth never opens and you want to try to get bigger exhales and bigger inhales only through the nose. Because what that does is it captures CO2. And CO2 is actually what dictates oxygen exchange at the cellular level. 
right? So you, you're holding back oxygen. It makes it possible for you to hold your breath that long. Had you not done that in advance, maybe you could hold your breath for three minutes, correct. two minutes. Yeah, correct. Yeah. And so that's how you train that ability, right? And so then when you want the exaggerated effect, then you do, you blow it off. And now all of a sudden you get that big, robust dopamine, dopaminergic response. You do that with some cold and do some breathing like that. Then you go start hitting some, some weights or whatever the workout's going to be. You're, you're, you're going to dr dramatically perform. Now it won't be able to be done every single time, right? I would use that type of strategy when you're just kind of not feeling up to it. Right? You're just not, the drive quite isn't there, or it's just a very important workout where you need to be on, or maybe a skill workout, right? So a, a workout where you're trying to pick up something new, right? Like a new technique or something like that. That's when you want more dopamine. Dopamine is a drive and recognition and problem solving type of hormone or type of neurotransmitter, sorry. So when you're trying to pick up a new technique, when you're trying to problem solve a puzzle, like BJJ, you know, because I'm I'm an ex-wrestler all, all my life. Oh, sick. growing up, yeah, since since I was like in first grade, that's all, awesome. All the way until I'm jealous. <laughs> that was something that I unknowingly did a lot of. Is I would actually do all my cardio work in in a, a sauna and stuff. I mean, that's a typical wrestler type thing, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but then what I would do is I would go outside and I would drill all my moves in the cold. Mm. And you just did that because you noticed it felt good. I didn't realize that what you were doing was... Yeah, because I knew, I mean, I didn't want to pass out, number mm -hmm. one, right? And I'm already f lightheaded and fainted from sweating so dang much and yeah. all of that. So I'm like, okay, I just need to, I just need to chill out, but I still mm -hmm. want to practice and I don't want to do it indoors because I might risk, you know, fainting and not doing very well. Mm -hmm. So I would just do it outside and I would just practice moves. And I started to pick up that I could feel differences in movements better when I got cold. Mm -hmm. Just, just, it, it doesn't even make sense really. It's almost like you're flying or moving without your eyes. You're starting to sense position, yeah. balance. It makes sense. So if, you were, if you were just to get out of bed mm -hmm. and you were all warm and cuddly and stuff and someone winged a football at you, I mean, odds of you catching it with some good grace and dexterity probably would be low. But if you just popped out of a cold plunge, I'm sure your chances would probably increase as long as you're not shivering. Yeah, so much. yeah. If you're if you're not to the point where you've actually induced the shivering effect, right. yeah, yeah. But yeah, you would. You would be way more alert. And most people will actually report that anytime they use a cold plunge, they feel more alert. They feel a little bit more mm -hmm. dopamine response for yeah. sometimes for another hour or two, right? Mm -hmm. And that's being increased now. My suggestion is you want to do something with that, right? That's when I try to do my most productive work. If it's, you know, working with clients or working with making programming or in this case, setting it up for a gym session that might be important to you or something along those lines. Um, but, you know, doing it every day isn't going to be detrimental. It's just now you can leverage it because you know some of the downstream responses of that. Now, you can accelerate this from an energetic standpoint if you introduce uh, a background dose of L-carnitine, for example, or a background dose of L-carnitine with choline and things of that nature um, so that the fatty acid dump that happens from that stress event of the, the cold exposure can now facilitate that higher influx of fatty acids into the bloodstream because the L-carnitine shuttle will shuttle more fatty acids into the mitochondria. But you got to inject it, right? Um, I would say you to get to feel the effect, yeah. you will need to acutely raise that L-carnitine shuttle. If you're consuming plenty of red meat, you're getting that effect, but it's not super physiological. Mm -hmm. Right. So that, that's what I will say. You, the injectable L-carnitine will shine when it comes to delivering that on demand, essentially. Yeah. That's what, again, I, I make injectable L-carnitine and things of that nature for these things. In fact, most of my company is based on things that actually influence the mitochondria and energetics at some level in that chain. And L-carnitine is one of them. And so you're actively bringing up the substrate utilization of the, the mitochondria there. But it does work, right? That is a thing where you can expose yourself to a little bit of cold, do a little bit of breathing. And again, the whole thing, the whole thing from start to finish, it could take 10 minutes, mm -hmm. right? Jump in the cold tub for three to four minutes, 
get out, do a little breathing for three or four minutes, you're ready to go, right? You, if you ingested some carnitine beforehand, like 60 minutes before that event, then you're going to dramatically accelerate how much fatty acids will be utilized for the physical work you're going to be doing. Is there a way to get injectable L-carnitine to not hurt so damn bad? It just yeah. stinks. It stings really bad. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so, so you, you're, I mean, that's why I, ha I have two products. One is a higher end product that's going to sting because it has a lot of milligrams in it. The lower product is really meant for smaller people. That's, uh, you know, that's how I advertise it, but, <laughs> it, it, <laughs> but, but it's essentially diluted, right? So, okay. Okay. so when that happens, right, if you get by just our normal, regular strength L-carnitine, it is diluted to the point where uh, there's going to be very, very minimal uh, pain, as much as it can be. The mm -hmm. other thing is the water that we use in it is not just water. That also is pH balanced and has some things that go in there to make sure that it's not acidic in nature, so it reduces the burn. Just a bitch. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm like, when it comes to this. Oh shit. no, no, no. I, I agree. <laughs> that, that's why I, I don't, I don't even really suggest using it every day just for that reason. Right. Like again, am I going to tell you to get cold and do this breathing thing every single time that you go into the gym? No, but you can quickly start to realize situationally how you can start using it to yeah. your advantage. Mm -hmm. Right. Maybe a match, right? Maybe an actual event that is like, okay, this is where I pull out the guns and I actually set it up. Now it's worth trialing it once or twice a week for to kind of see how you respond, see how you can take advantage of it. Just like the cold, right? Like getting cold and, and practicing a new technique. You're you're trying to figure out if my, you know, like if you're practicing a new technique in BJJ. You're trying to distinguish just a little bit. Do I get a little bit more leverage if I move just an inch or two this way or an inch or two this way? You're trying to figure out what the difference is. That's what how you dial in technique. Yeah. When dopamine is high, you are more sensitive to those responses and things of that nature. And uh, then you can augment that by dumping more fatty acids into the mitochondria, which also means neural activity will be higher because you have a lot of mitochondria at the nervous system level. Most of your mitochondria is buried here and here as, as, a, as a human, whereas a, uh, a primate, for example, has most of their mitochondria in their muscles, actually. Mm. Yeah, not nearly as much in the brain um, compared to a human. Um, so there's that little hack. Uh, the methylene blue is an, an example of kind of hacking the mitochondria because it donates electrons to the mitochondria so this is drops gentlemen drops this is just drops just okay. drops just, just drops, drops. Yeah, yeah. you don't have to inject nah, it yeah you don't have to inject it but the, the, it's not all well it is rainbows blue rainbows <laughs> uh, what do you mean by blue rainbows <laughs> it stains everything blue uh, like your mouth or, or your, uh, okay. your urine. <laughs> okay. It can make everything blue. Yeah. Sounds like yeah. fun. Make your toilet blue. Yeah. Well, okay. So you're about to explain what it does, but how often do you use methylene blue? Do you also use it, Mark? I've never seen it. I've been blue. using it, yeah. yeah. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, it, it really depends on what you're trying to accomplish. It's not a long-term supplement that you take in the background like creatine. A lot of the stuff uh, from him and a lot of the stuff from uh, Super Brain, Andy, um, it's not stuff that I use all the time every day. Mm -hmm. It's like I use it as he's mentioning situationally and I haven't taken the methylene blue enough to, um, to be able to report a lot of information on it just yet. But what I will say about the carnitine, especially carnitine choline combo is you can take small amounts. I don't think people maybe realize, I think, uh, I don't know, people get excited and they want to take the amount that's on the things. Mm -hmm. so they want to take a milliliter of it or whatever because mm -hmm. they want to see the effect or they want to feel the effect. But I've noticed, um, and I'm thankful that Super Brain kind of coached me through this. He was like, nah, man, he's like, just take these little amounts. Mm -hmm. Take these little amounts, get used to this, see how this feels. How small are we talking? And we'll go from there. Um, just on an insulin pin, I would, I would, uh, it would be like quarter you know, quarter, not, not, uh, so, so full would be like a full milliliter. Mm -hmm. I'd take like, I don't know, so like 0. 0.25 or whatever that would be on mm -hmm. the insulin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 20 uh, units. Yeah. 20 I ended units. up moving that shit down too. Cause it stung, but still a bitch. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, I got it. I got maybe it's gonna it. It stung so bad. I was like, I'm, I gotta make it worth it and actually get like the most out so of it. So then one. I also, uh, have experimented with utilizing different things to inject with, which scares the fuck out of people. But to me, it makes it more comfortable. I don't know if you found that too, mm. but if you just inject with a regular needle, it, 
works way better <clears throat> instead of a tiny little, <laughs> little yeah one. yeah i know <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah it like it feels better <laughs> <laughs> i think that's I experience my, talking, my, get in there deeper yeah <laughs> my sure my favorite recommendation for that particular situation is a 27 gauge half inch half mm-hmm. inch needle how big is yeah that? that's about what you're i mean what if, was if recommended it, to us if, if it gets smaller I, I use that. if it gets smaller mm-hmm. it tends to just kind of not be able to get it deep enough and you get into that subcutaneous layer and the mm-hmm. reason why it's going to sting is because l-carnitine and choline are not fat soluble mm. they're water soluble only so mm. if you would get it deep enough it tends to disperse and move out of that area very quickly mm. okay right so again it plays on you know oh now i got to use it bigger syringe or whatnot but again it's not one of those things where i'm like you just have to use it you have to use it i'm like no it's it's an enhancement of that course. can be acute and that can be leveraged yeah and if it, if you know when to leverage it it's all you really need to know mm-hmm. right you don't i am never you know i almost have a, almost like the tony hughes approach mm-hmm. of like i don't really take anything forever Except for if it's like hormone replacement. Is Tony? Is that the Tony Hughes approach though? Uh, he, that yeah. sounds the opposite he, of the Tony Hughes well, approach. No, I mean, he goes on those mass blasts he, he, and then he, he chills. Yeah, um, like he's he's always like, oh, well, now I'm true. taking. That, yeah. I'm always taking. I'm I'm taking this. Now I'm taking that. I'm taking that. Now I'm taking this. Okay. You, you, okay. you know what I mean? Now, does he know the? I don't know. Yeah, you know, I don't know if he knows exactly what he's doing. I, love, I asked him one time, I was like, <laughs> you should write a book on supplements or something. And then he sent me a video of like his house and how many supplements he had around. It was just insane. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't, I, just, like I said, I, don't, like, I can't keep track of anything because I don't know what actually works because I take so many different things in combination. Dude. Yeah, I, I, I don't have it quite like that. But <laughs> what I'm saying is when it comes to like performance enhancement <laughs> from like these types of things, mm-hmm. it's l- literally situational in nature. Situ- exactly. Situational in nature is usually... But again, if you understand, you know, how these things work, you can apply it in the right situation. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, like the methylene blue, that that's an interesting compound as far as like what it does um, at the mitochondrial level because it's actually blue, okay? Let's turn into that blue guy that's behind you doing the pec deck. <laughs> yeah. <Squirtle. laughs> yeah. Uh, and what it does is it actually absorbs infrared light. So it has infrared light starts at like 600 nanometers all the way up to 2000 nanometers or so. Um, And methylene blue has an absorption spectra of 660. Now go back to maybe if you remember what I said about the mitochondria and the red light chromophores, they have somewhere in the 660, 650 nanometer range all the way. Yeah. So methylene blue has a 660. So it, and, and it's an electron donor. So when it comes in, it donates electrons to the electron transport chain, just right. like food would, but without eating anything. And because it's electron negative, it will go to the ATPase that's spinning right to those chromophores, lands there, and it also enhances the pickup of infrared light or sunlight from two ends. The electron end, because you need electrons to pick up electrons. That's the photoelectric effect via Einstein. And it also uh, in, enhances how much red light, because it's a red light chromophore. It picks up 660. So your mitochondria now pick up more electrons, and your to- whole body picks up more electrons, and you pick up more infrared light. So taking it while outside as a way to almost hack the system of immediately I'm going to be able to pick up more more light information. Is there anything negative to... Yes. V- okay, yeah. so... Yeah, you, you, you do not want to take it if you're on any kind of SSRI. Okay. okay. Because it, w- it acts very mildly as an SSRI, but mainly it's going to inhibit the breakdown process. Of, just tell uh, us what an SSRI is for people. To uh, any kind of depression drug, name them all. Name so maybe them. even someone that's just depressed, maybe they shouldn't even think of that. Think of that product. Uh, I would, I would probably say not as a first line, but it would be like, okay, make a, a true self-assessment, right? Like I'm not promoting anybody to take it or anything like that. I'm saying if you are by any chance taking any medication for depression, forget that I mentioned that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> if you're not Fair. those people, then you can start thinking about this in the ways that I spoke about as far as the enhancement properties that it can potentially bring to the table. Um, 
situationally dependent, meaning because this is all well and good, but taking it forever, is there a detriment there? Yes, the detriment is that there is very, it's, it's hard to really get it in a completely pure state when it comes to heavy metals. So that doesn't mean that you're going to get heavy metal poisoning for using it a month or two or anything like that. But if you, by default now, I'm going to take it for a whole year and mm -hmm. see what happens, that's not a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like it's just, that is, and, and that's not even really with just that drug. There is lots of supplements out there. It, hell, lots of food. I mean, rice is now labeled with arsenic, right? Like the, you, you have arsenic in rice. You've got to be careful with that. Like so many things, right? But going back to something kind of, uh, you know, cause immediately I bring up the heavy metal and everybody goes, Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But fish also has heavy metals in it. Yeah. But well, there's lots of studies out there that say, well, heavy metals from fish don't matter. Why? Because they have a lot of iodine and a lot of selenium, which is literally the antidote to heavy metals. <laughs> okay. So it, nature is kind of a self-regulating thing, right? Yeah. It never really kind of puts out there without, mm. but you know what? The reason why is because it's had 3.8 million years to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> True. Okay. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I, I find it somewhat hilarious that people, especially this day and age, think that they're going to somehow surpass what nature has already figured out. Mm -hmm. I, I've, it's, it's not possible <laughs> unless somehow you time travel and figure it out for 3.8 billion years yourself. I have a quick question. And this is, I hope we don't. We were on Methylene Blue, so if we want to continue there, yeah, continue. Yeah, but going back to the sun thing, you know that guy Brian Johnson, that mm -hmm, guy who's mm -hmm. trying to, you know how he avoids the sun because of the skin damage it causes and he goes about other ways? I don't know if you know, but like, I, I don't know exactly the other ways, but I, I do vaguely know. Yeah. He, you know, he utilizes some red light therapy, but he really avoids the sun, mm -hmm. right? Because of the damage it causes the skin and he's trying to reverse his biological age and all that shit, right? Mm -hmm. So if someone is listening to that type of stuff and now they have the idea that like, well, if I get too much sun exposure, I'm aging myself and my mm -hmm. skin, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Is there any legitimacy behind that idea? You know, because we, we, we're talking about all these benefits of getting more sun and mm -hmm. people need to be getting more sun. Then you have this person over here who's trying to get less. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, so... Uh, it really depends, going back to what I said about environment. It depends on your environment. Now I'm going to take it a step further to kind of complicate things. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's always about complicating things more, right? So he's talking about an external environmental stressor called the sun, right? There's also your internal environment that may change or does change, actually. does change every season, changes as you age. Your internal environment changes and some of the factors that will dictate whether sun is aging the skin or not mm -hmm. will depend on things like your omega-3 index, right? Remember what I said about your omega-3 index, how yeah. it's actually meant to be broken down by the sun for this anti-aging restorative effect at the cellular level. Um, not just at the skin, but at the brain and at the eye and at the nervous system level. That's actually where most of your DHA is, is in your brain and your eye and your heart. Because think of it like we're very eye-dominant species, right? Everything is about the eyes and mm -hmm. the frontal lobes right here. That's why your eyes are in the front and you have this very short tract called your retinal epithelium tract, uh, your RPE. Basically, it's the nerve that connects your eyeball okay. to your yeah. brain. That's full of melanin because it wants the fastest fiber highway possible to get the right information as quickly and efficiently as possible to your frontal lobes. Okay. Right? So if you're actively breaking down DHA that's in that system via sunlight, you're enhancing that system versus breaking it down with artificial light because the DHA that gets broken down under artificial light, think of, think of it almost like burning the oil on a pan. When you break it down with the wrong level of heat, mm -hmm. it breaks down into black crap. When you break it down just to the right level, level of heat, you cook food that tastes amazing, right? That's, think of it like that. DHA is breaking, being broke down you no matter what. What breaks it down dictates how the end product comes out. Okay. Right. 
uh, in the modern world. That's how it's being broken down, mm -hmm. right? Artificial lighting is going to break it down into non-useful products. So that's over time actually probably going to age his eye tract first because it's going to be the first thing to, to be sensitive to that because that's where you have the most DHA that needs to be flawless. Okay. So poor thinking, poor eye function. His skin will look great. Yeah. <laughs> was didn't um what's his name the uh, Ron Pena he he talked to us about like a a study that was done on Asian children who were able to get more actual sunlight mm -hmm. and that group of children versus the group of children that were inside more like those the children that got more sunlight didn't necessarily need glasses they had better overall eyesight mm -hmm. so that's just it's an interesting thing what what you're saying kind of falls in line with that. yeah not even that uh, it goes even further the uh, the kids that were not getting direct sunlight, more than likely they also had more tablets, more things of that nature. That actually predisposes you to something called myopia, which is the elongation of the eye. Because when blue light enters the eye, think of the Pink Floyd album cover, right? With mm. the prism, with the light going through it. Blue light bends the most versus the other light forms. So when blue light enters your eye, it bends more from the two ends. Basically, everything that enters the eye needs to converge at the back of the eye, right? To, to hit your, your retina at the back. Blue light has to bend the most, which means that the light, if most of the, blue light, most of the light entering the eye is blue, mm -hmm. it learns to get a little bit longer so that the light that's bending the most ends up hitting the center of the retina better. It's an adaption to blue light dominant life. Wow. Oh. Mm -mm. Okay. I'd, I'd imagine just being indoors too doesn't allow your vision to go pat further past than like as big as this building, right? So they're Correct. not, they're not yeah, extending. Yeah, there is that effect as well, mm -hmm. right? There's the binocular versus near vision, far vision. There's mm -hmm. that effect too. But just the light alone will create that adaption, even if you're not necessarily staring at a tablet that's close, mm -hmm. right? Because blue light dominance means that most of the light entering your eye is bending more than your eye is constructed for. So when you're young and you're malleable, you make an adaption. Mm -hmm. Why the combination of uh, choline and carnitine? What's the synergistic effect there? Yeah, so choline brings a accelerated methyl or methyl donor, right? So what what, what does that mean, right? The L-carnitine itself brings more fatty acids into the mitochondria. Once the fatty acid's there, it's not doing anything until it goes through oxidation and it's broken down into FADH and NADH. Those two go to cytochrome one or two. In order to break down the fatty acid into NADH and FADH, you need choline to be, or methyl, a methyl group to be donated here. Choline is a methyl donor. So we've, you know, the, the dumping of the fatty acid into the bloodstream happened from the cold or some kind of a stress event. The L-carnitine accelerated pulling it out of the blood and into the cell, into the mitochondria. And then once it's in the mitochondria and it goes into the middle of the mitochondria, now it needs choline there or a methyl donor. It doesn't necessarily have to be choline, but a methyl donor to accelerate the oxidate, oxidate oxidation of the fatty acid now choline does another thing the reason because a methyl donor can be anything it can be like uh even a, a green tea extract that's a methyl donor it could be a methyl donors are lots of them but the reason why i chose choline is because choline actually also if there's excess can be used to make acetylcholine at the brain level so now you're accelerating mental capacity and synapse changes and stuff like that you're accelerating brain thinking like alpha gpc type thing yeah alpha right. gpc is a form of choline that's specific mm. for brain function so uh, you're just delivering raw choline for your body to do whatever it needs to do with it if it needs more methyl donation it's going to use it for that if it needs for more raw choline for acetylcholine manufacturing it's going to use it for that it kind of is a, a multiple pathway type of thing so you know, you're just playing on the metabolism at that point of just making sure that there's enough of that whenever you're going to augment the metabolism. Tell us about some of the other products on your website. Maybe you can have Andrew uh, punch it up. I don't know. Yeah, DurrellStrength.com, D-E-R-E-L. Because um, you have some other combinations of things that have 
different amounts of choline and different. Yeah, yeah. So there is uh, the choline, carnitine choline combination comes in two flavors, three flavors actually. Two, uh, flavor one is just the original KO can. Uh, black label, and that's the the extra. Oh, strap. so you're the one who owns the site. <laughs> Remember when I was ordering? Uh, I think it was, was Carnitine. Jake's mm-hmm. like, get it from here. It's like a few years ago. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. Interest. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you go to buy now, you'll see all the products and stuff like okay. that. But uh, I think you made the first, right? The first Carnitine Choline combo. I did. Yeah. In fact, Jake was buying it from me before he started ever doing anything with it. Wow, that's sick. What's the CEO? The C, so that, so yeah, so three flavors are col- uh, carnitine choline combination. So. There's the re- uh, extra strength, which is the black label. Um, that one's just going to have the most milligrams of plenty of carnitine and plenty of choline to make sure that everything that we've talked about so far is kind of working flawlessly. The reg- the white label, the, the regular strength uh, KO can. That's going to be the the one that I said. You're probably just going to want to start with that because you just you just don't really need an aggressive amount of choline to get an effect, especially if you're kind of new to this type of stuff. And it's going to be the one that's more mild when it comes to uh, pain and stuff like that. And then there's the CEO. That one's actually flipped. That one has more choline than L-carnitine in it. Mm-hmm. And it's there to facilitate everything that I just talked about, about the choline. So that's mainly, the, hence the name, for people to spend most of their time doing mental tasks, mental, you know, a CEO type of environment. You're not really going to be that physically active. You don't need that much L-carnitine to, uh, you know, f- flex uh, uh, substrates into the into the mitochondria for for physical energy. But have you uh, paired that with anything? Like, have you had that with like a, say a cup of coffee when you're doing some work or something? Mm-hmm. I don't know if you're coffee. Mm-hmm. Drinker, but... Yeah, yeah. So things that you can do there is a little bit of nicotine. A little, like just a, a, a quarter of a square of, of, of nicotine gum with some of that. Yeah, that's that, that's a really great enhancement because nicotine also upregulates the cholinergic system. Some people aren't realizing there's a Dragon Ball Z theme here, but what is the Sensu? Like, what is that? <laughs> you know, you, you, I told you guys about Sensu beans. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 So is it like glutathione or something? Don't it, don't take that. <laughs> <laughs> don't touch that one. <laughs> no, uh, it's a... Uh, a reconstitution water for glutathione. Now you can take it by itself because it does have, it has NAD plus in it and it has taurine mm-hmm. and it has uh, N-acetylcysteine or NAC in it just by itself. But it's mainly advertised to be able to reconstitute uh, glutathione. You basically made steroid water. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, yep. Wait, so it's not yeah, that, that blue water that you made is interesting too. It has like minerals in it or something like that, right? Yeah, yeah, that's for reconstituting growth hormone. Okay, yeah. what's the SSJ? Because that has to be something wild. It's yeah. got a yellow label. It's it's the Super <laughs> Saiyan. So what's in there? Uh, so that's the the black label base. So that's going to be a high amount of L carnitine with a pretty moderate amount of choline plus ATP already in it. Mm. So what what would one feel when using something like that? Versus the SSJ one, yeah. you're, you're going to feel like you want to run, mm. like you want to move yeah. a lot. You're, you're re- I mean, because you're you're providing the raw substrate, the ATP, right off the bat, and then you're providing all of the downstream effects to even create more of that. Um, and that is basically going to make you feel pretty damn energized, like for s- at least an hour or two without wow. any caffeine. There won't be Shit. any. Like it just kind of stops working, like not stops working, but you've just kind of utilized it. Mm-hmm. Like think of it, think of it this way. Think about when you were young and you woke up and you were just like, I'm going to fucking kill this day. Mm-hmm. Right. And you just have so much damn energy that you don't mm-hmm. even know what to do with it. Right. And that's about what you're going to feel momentarily. Okay. Because you're really providing an abundant amount of ATP yeah. immediately. Um, but because it's ATP, it has to be used. So you got to be careful, right? We do sell uh, an ATP product by itself, but that's, again, momentarily use. So if you take too much ATP, yeah, you can, you can risk, you know, a heart arrhythmia because you're, you're, you're literally providing so much raw energy that if you're not moving, something's going to have to use it. Your heart rate will spike up a little bit. That's sort of like, yeah, it's, again, none of this stuff is a free lunch. Yeah. Right. Know what you're doing. If you don't know, start small. Right. 
and and go from there if, if that's what you choose to do. But yeah, that that's that's what that is. The time chamber, for example, that's a learning type of cocktail. So yeah, what's in that one? So it's it's got uh, the same thing, uh, base of L carnitine choline, um, and a little bit of selenic. Here we go. Do you know what Selenka is? Uh, so I I don't, but I well I mean it's we kind of do on the show before, but, but I am super interested it. in learning more. Yeah, yeah, uh, and I got to take some Selenka before you talk about it, so that way it all sticks, I guess. Yeah, so it's <laughs> well the the way that I like to describe it, it can be used again like almost any of these things in sit, lots of different situations, but mm-hmm. the way that I want to describe it with the formula that it's being used that's going to be the most useful for, say, any kind of an athlete is, again, technique, practice, learning something new, learning to ingrain better, okay, yeah. uh, uh, being able to connect with a muscle that you don't really normally connect very well with, that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. But it can you be used lots of different ways. And the best way to kind of think about it to kind of get the right decision-making process is the Selenk momentarily clears noise in the background from your brain. Oh, that'd be nice. Oh, man. Right. So you can be more focused. And then I don't mean like focused like caffeine focused. Oh, yeah. I mean focused like when you're in flow state. I mean focused like, hey, I just did some hops, and I could tell that three of those hops were bad and the other five were not. Mm-hmm. Right? Because you can tell a minute difference in contact time and all that. That's what it enhances. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what that's mainly for. Uh, again, high energetics so that you can practice it longer. Like this is something where you're, you're just going to drill something for a couple of hours, right? But you don't want to get tired and you don't want to, because the moment you start getting tired, you start making faulty technique changes, yeah, right? right. So, that. Yeah, so that you got to stop or you should stop. Right, let's put it that way. You don't have to stop, but you should stop if your purpose was to technique drill, right? Mm-hmm. So this basically gives you that particular enhancement in a bottle to be able to drill it for about as long as you probably want to. And correct me if I'm wrong, but it's um, it's something that like like let's take the drills and all of a sudden you you drill them and you're drilling them completely wrong, and then that sticks, and then now that's kind of stuck there, right? You can't unlearn this bad technique. It, it's I wouldn't say you can't unlearn it, but it's going to be more difficult, right? Mm-hmm. So that's what I'm saying. It's one of those things where if you don't know. And again, when I say you don't know what you're doing, is just you you don't know, right? You don't have a coach. You just start kind of going through it, and you think you're doing the technique correctly, and you're actually not. Um, but you know, the, it can even be applied even before you start the drilling, right? Like you can literally, for example, maybe you're an Olympic weightlifter, right? So you watch perfect Olympic snatch technique, literally on the phone or a screen, yeah. right before you go do it. That's not a, an unknown hack. Right, like that. People kind of already do that. Hey, I'm really jazzed for this particular lift. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to actually watch this particular person over and over on repeat for 20 minutes before I go to the gym or whatever. Yeah, take that before. Now you start ingraining it visually before you even start to do it, and then you actually start uh, playing that back as you do it in a more crisp and highlighted manner. How often can you take this stuff? As <laughs> realistically. I wouldn't, I would say don't do it for every training session. I, you know, this is the coach in me you yeah. know, saying I'd probably do it twice a week Yeah, with purpose. So I think actually, I, I remember, I remember this conversation we had with Annie about this stuff and that's, that's mm-hmm. why you mentioned that. So like any dangers to this, like, okay, you mentioned taking it twice a week. So there's a reason why someone wouldn't be taking it every day. Yeah. Because you don't know what you're not, you don't know what you don't know as far as what you're picking up. Ah, Okay, yeah. Go back to what he highlighted. If you learn something you didn't necessarily want to learn, it's going to be hard to unlearn, Mm -hmm. right? Like bad habits. I mean, you name it, right? Yeah. It's one of those things where this is highlighting your ability to pick up. Basically, think of it like, you know, if there was a whiteboard here and I drew a skyline of uh, New York City, for example, you would be able to tell pretty easy, right? Mm -hmm. That's New York City. But what if I drew a bunch of scribbles and a little bunch of crap in the background, it'd be harder to tell that skyline, yeah. right? But if I wiped it clean and I just drew three of the buildings that you know, you'd be able to tell immediately what that was. Mm-hmm. Selenk is like wiping the board clean momentarily so that mm-hmm. anything that you're focusing in on or looking for or recognizing gets cued in. It comes to the front of the <clears throat> front of the board, Yeah, right? So 
if you took it all the time, that's potentially going to interfere with learning in general mm -hmm. and probably picking up things that you didn't really think that you were picking up that now you have. Yeah. Right? And then how fast does it, does it start to take effect after you inject it? And then how long does something like that last? As far as like the actual like, okay, it's worn off now as far as what it's doing, but obviously the effects that if you if they stick, they're going to stick around probably forever. Yeah, I would say that about a three hour window from the moment you wow. inject it to like when you'd get done training, basically a training session, right? Like you would, you would want to inject it closer to a training, close-ish, right? About an hour before training or something like that. Um, all the way up to like right before, you know, 20 minutes before arriving at the gym. And it would probably last most of your training session, mm -hmm. if not all of it. Uh, and then, but then, right, that's the heating up, right? Like Andy talks about this, right? That's the heating up of that particular neuroengram or memory or whatever you want to call it. Neuro, you're, you're engaging it in lots of different uh, sensations, senses, vision, playback, hearing, touch, all of that. You know, especially if you, if you do it in this type of a background. So now that particular technique or drill that you're trying to learn, is very hot. It's very, now you got to cool it down, right? So then it becomes don't engage with anything that may be similar to what you're trying to pick up for the next little while, ideally the next day. Intr okay. Right. Okay. So, you, so you wouldn't want to like take this and then, you know, train that morning and then later that afternoon start showing, you know, your training partner this new drill that you trained mm -hmm. when you're not really into that thing. You want to make sure it fully cools and maybe do it the next day, right? It doesn't mean you can't talk about it or anything yeah. like that. It just means you probably wouldn't want to mess up what you did before because everything's still kind of fresh as far as like, and, and that's not a hard concept to understand. This just is an enhancement mm -hmm. to exploit that quicker. Right? Yeah. Normally it takes you, let's just hypothetically say, it's hypothetical, right? takes you 10 weeks to pick up a new drill and really refine it. This could potentially accelerate that to maybe half, right? Mm. right. It's a big deal. But yeah. probably not something that you would, like, you probably want to take choline instead for, like, uh, st you're studied for a test and then you take the test, right? This wouldn't be good for, like, a memory retention or memory recall? Only if you already knew what you were trying to memory recall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Right. Like, mm -hmm. you already know the test, so now you, you stu Put study it the practice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is more along the lines of like picking up a technique. You know what the technique should look like. You know what it should feel like. So that sets you up for more success by using something like this. But if, you, if you're just studying in general, I would probably go with something more like Nupapt or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit, it, do, it doesn't, doesn't do quite the same thing. Um, and it just overall generally enhances learning that way more, you know, more... Uh, Stupid proof is the best <laughs> way to put it. I mean, th that's the problem. You run into these types of things with mm -hmm. people that, that take them and don't really know what, what they're going to be doing. Yeah. You know, they just, my buddy took that, so I'm going to take it. And, mm -hmm. and they don't get the same response. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Have you had an opportunity to mix together your powerlifting prowess with your wrestling technique? Or was the uh, powerlifting well after you had yeah, done well, wrestling? It was, it was well after. It was well after. In fact, there was a period there where I got to, out of high school. Uh, I, I had a scholarship to, to wrestle if I wanted to, but right off the bat, I, I knew that that wasn't going to get me anywhere, right? That was kind of like when UFC was just barely mm -hmm. getting going. And, and I did fight for a year in MMA, cool. but immediately after my first championship win, uh, I realized that wasn't something that I wanted to do because mm -hmm. I won, but I got my nose broke. <laughs> and... I had to pay all the bills and then I got paid. I'm like, well, this isn't even <laughs> enough to make a living off of at all, especially if I break my nose because I won. <laughs> yeah. So immediately I was like, mm, you know what? Probably better rethink that. Right. So I just focused on work. Right. And so for a period of time there, about five years, I didn't actually step a foot into the gym ever for five years mm. after I graduated. And that's, when I got married finally and then uh, started, I, ne I needed something, right? I had a nine to five job in the oil field and I would just go to work. Nine to five being loose, right? You're always on call and that sort of stuff and, and things of that nature. But I had time, right? I had time to just explore hobbies. So that's when I started picking up going to the gym. Just what do you think of, uh, I don't know if you had a gym background previously, but what are your thoughts on like, 
powerlifting or utilizing some powerlifting for a particular sport. Um, do you think, uh, you know, you think like, I don't know, having the ability to squat 400 pounds or deadlift 500 pounds, do you think it has a lot of merit to like the field or the mat? Um, or, or, I think, just, I yeah, think, I think strength in general is, should be priority number one, how you achieve that strength, personal preference completely. I think so, especially being a human and especially if the sport doesn't involve the barbell, right? If the sport doesn't involve the barbell, I think there is more efficient ways to enhance things. Now that does not mean that those movements are bad in any way. It means that if you're a high end athlete, maybe those moves are always in the background at some level, but the meat and potatoes starts to become something slightly different that enhances specific strength for specific outcomes. I think that's fair to say. Yeah, no reason to kill yourself with a regular barbell squat when it hurts your knees all the time and you're trying to be proficient at wrestling. Yeah, right. But yeah. maybe some type of squat would be, and it would also be a great idea to explore why does your knee hurt? 100%. Right. Both of those, right? Both of those. Why does it hurt? Well, that probably means that you're neglecting some kind of movement, some kind of uh, plane of movement that you normally don't engage in, right? So if you don't start exploring other movements, then you'll never find out, Right type of squat right like make it more specific make it with a sandbag right try squatting with the sandbag that's hard as hell mm -hmm. <laughs> especially if you hold it in different positions different things like that you're that for a wrestler right it's still a squat but completely different stimulus mm -hmm. much more specific to that person for their particular sport now coming from and i played football and you know was in the weight room you know my whole you know career you know uh, coming up in, in school and stuff. But, uh, yeah, for the, when I started powerlifting, I just noticed that I was perpetually better at displaying strength in those movements, probably from my wrestling background. Like I could grind incredibly well. Mm -hmm. Like it literally looked like uh, I have time to, you know, what the, you know, uh, what the the tendo type units or whatever right? my a max squat for me is right around five seconds right so i can i can move a barbell through space with maximal effort for five seconds now that's an attribute that most good power lifters will eventually acquire i just happen to already be predisposed to that i think it's from a wrestling background because yeah. that's that's how wrestling or grappling in general is you have to learn to contract a muscle and put full force on it for extended periods of time you know 30 seconds at a time 10 seconds at a time and then how to dissipate that with a moving you know another moving person right so you're countering and un and uncountering movement dynamics the whole time so you're actually trying to stay in position but moving different muscles at the same time mm -hmm. that is a unique skill that can help immensely with just powerlifting in general or any sport where you have to just contract muscles for longer periods of time, more than a split second. Right. Yeah. Gave us some good practical advice on like blue light and some other things. Um, what are, what are some things we can maybe do about our phone or what are some things we should be conscious of when it comes to 3g, 4g, 5g, Wi-Fi, all the above. Yeah. So, I mean, right off the bat, let's just kind of unwrap that, that whole envelope a little bit. Right. If, if, you know, so far we've come down the rabbit hole of, of your mitochondria are exquisitely sensitive to environmental inputs and they change the outcomes quickly. You're this day and age part of our environment that most people aren't even thinking about, right? We've, we've talked quite a bit about fake lighting, artificial lighting, right? How does it do that? But another light of the spectrum is light that you can't see, right? Everybody kind of knows about infrared therapy, right? There's red light bulbs on it, but there's also light bulbs. If you ever had an infrared therapy lamp, there is light bulbs that look like they're not on. Yeah, yeah. Okay? That's infrared. You can't physically see that, right? Well, a cell phone, for example, treat it, think of it like a blue light spectrum that you can't see. Wi-Fi, wireless communications, that type of stuff. Now, I worked in the oil field being an instrumentation and automation tech for 10 years. That was literally what I did. I knew about wireless communications. And even then, I didn't really understand the impact that it has on biology while I worked there, right? Like while I did that. And the reason for that is because I just 
you know, thought of it as my job and I'm sending a signal to this thing clear out there and it's doing a thing and yeah, that's cool. I knew things that, you know, you needed to do to make sure that that communication was flawless, like grounding it correctly and things of that nature. But I really didn't think about how that was affecting me or other people, right? Living organisms until I had a cell phone tower built next to my house, right? Now, at first, I would, I was still working my nine to five job and I would leave the house every day. You know, 16 hours later, I might come back and that kind of went on for a year or so. And I noticed not a lot other than sometimes, especially in the winter, I had a harder time recovering from trading. I just chalked it up to being old, right? Like I'm getting older. That's going to happen, right? But at the same time, I also was enhanced, right? So I'm, I'm going to be able to leverage it for much longer than most people as far as like continually being able to recover from the onslaught that I might put on myself. And that went on for about 18 months or so. And then I quit my job and started coaching full-time and working from home full-time. When that happened, not even six months later, things went to shit. Like as far as like recovery, tendon, ligament, strength, and not even strength, just like knowing and feeling that my tendons and ligaments were pissed off. Like to the point where I was just like, man, what is going on? Right. So bump up the growth hormone dose, bump up the testosterone dose, try to outrun it with drugs, go over my nutrition. You know, I'm like, what am I not eating? You know, do I need more collagen? Do I need, what, what, what do I need to get in here to, to get this fixed? Mm -hmm. And, you know, did that for quite a while, just troubleshooting that and troubleshooting that. And, and next thing I know, it's just not, not really helping to the point where I ended up flaring up some EBV just because I continued to train, even though the signs were there to stop training. But I just, I was trying to figure out why things were going wrong to begin with. Then I, you know, got that and I stopped training, started feeling a little bit better, reduced, all, took all my dosages away other than just basic eight, uh, TRT. And then there was some, a lot of inflammation going on as far as with EBV in general, what it does as far as like lymph nodes being inflamed, fever every afternoon, that sort of stuff. Now that wasn't caused by the cell phone tower. That was a side effect of running my biology into the ground of not being able to recover. Right. And, and I knew that, right. So when it, when that whole episode kind of passed and I was cleared to go back to training, I knew that the outcome wasn't going to be different, right? Like that's rule number one, don't do the same thing again <laughs> and expect a different outcome. Yeah. Okay. So immediately I go, okay, well, something's wrong. I don't really know what is wrong, but I know that if I start training again, start doing things again, I don't, I don't feel like I've changed anything, so more than likely it's going to happen again, okay? Now, maybe that was my training, right? So I started looking into that a little bit, and, you know, anyway, rabbit hole ran around, and then finally talked to some friends here, talked to friends there, and they started connecting me with people talking about weird things, okay? <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Yeah. To the point where eventually uh, I got connected with a neurosurgeon uh, to, to do a consultation with him and kind of get introduced to some of the stuff that he's putting out there and that sort of stuff. Um, and it basically had to do with electromagnetic fields and 5G networks and wireless communications. And he happens to work with, with people that are sensitive to those things or people that are more going to be more predisposed to be affected by those things. NFL players with TBIs, uh, people that, that have, you know, autoimmune disorders. So TBIs mean traumatic brain injuries? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yep, and things of that nature. And anyway, so a lot of the, a lot of the questions asked of like uh, my assessment there was questions that are most people would think they're weird, right? When you're trying to figure out some kind of a biological problem or some kind of thing, yeah. you know, where do you live? What, what, what kind of car do you drive? What kind of cell phone you have? Is there power lines next to your house? Do you live next to a substation? Do you, you know, is there a cell phone tower next to your house? And and, you know, finally I'm like, well, yeah, there, there's a cell phone tower next to my house. And then basically he's like, well, you're going to have to move. <laughs> just kind of said it that way. You're going to have to move. And he's like, I know that you, I'm not going to convince you of it just by telling you. So go get it tested. Get your house tested. And then you'll be able to make a decision, right? Because at the end of the day, 
the decision wasn't just mine, right? Even though I was the one experiencing those types of effects. And that's the problem is your epigenetic toolbox dictates the outcome of what you're going to experience. So me saying these things, right? I want to make this pretty clear. Me saying that I got joint and tendon ligament issues and flared up my ABV does not mean that other people will get that exact same outcome if they're living to a, to a cell phone tower. They might experience, hey, I go outside for six hours and I don't make any vitamin D. They might experience... <laughs> Whoa. Yeah, they might experience that they go outside and their sex hormone panel, or they go outside a lot, you know, they eat well, they train well, but their sex hormone panel is shot. And they don't understand why. And th there's going to be so many different iterations of weird shit. Because of all the things that I mentioned at the very beginning, which is why I started with them, of like cold and environment and things that your biology has been entrained to recognize and utilize, right? Because nothing gets wasted in nature ever, mm -hmm. right? So environmental inputs are actually used to do work inside your body, okay? When you're around electromagnetic fields, think of a magnet and another magnet. One's going to repel the other, right? Mm -hmm. So... The sun is an electromagnetic field. When you live right next to a, a much weaker electromagnetic field, but you're really close to it, you're going to repel or diminish your ability to create some of these substrates from sunlight. That again, that's legit. Some of my some of my uh, clients have some of those problems. That's why I'm bringing them up. Yeah. Like, not every that it's not ubiquitous, right? You're not going to experience the same reality I experience, but Nonetheless, you'll experience something weird. Um, and it'll be really hard to troubleshoot because you don't, you know, nobody mm -hmm. thinks about these things, right? So, Or they think these things are bullshit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that, that is a legitimate argument. Yeah. No, my cell phone's not harming me. Yeah. Yeah, my, my, the cell phone tower that's, you know, 100 yards away, 300 yards away, there's no way that's doing anything to me. It's perfectly safe. The government told me so. <laughs> <laughs> right? So... You know, you got to make your own decisions there. Who's yeah. packing your parachute? Mm. So I hate to sound like a broken record, but your sleep quality most likely sucks. Aww. It's one of the biggest <laughs> things that we talk about on the podcast. So many guests have come on and talked about how sleep can help you stick to your diet, stick to your workout plan, lose body fat, gain muscle, all the good things that you're trying to do, but it's hard to do because you might be snoring. And if you're snoring, that's why we've partnered with Hostage Tape, which is mouth tape that you can put over your nose your mouth when you're asleep to help you stop snoring and breathe through your nose. But if you have been breathing through your nose this whole time while you've been sleeping, it's going to be a little bit difficult to get air through there. That's also why hostage tape has nose strips to help open up your nasal airways and make it easier to breathe through your nose when you're asleep. Now your partner won't be having a f with you when you're asleep because you'll be actually breathing through your nose. Andrew, how can they get it? Yes, that's over at hostagetape.com slash power project where you guys will receive an entire year supply of nasal strips and mouth tape all for less than a dollar a night. Again, that's at hostagetape.com slash power project. Links in the description as well as the podcast show notes. So when it does come to stuff like this, because like you mentioned um, in the gym how like when you, if you could go over like how you kind of like measured where you were or tested that area right mm -hmm. um which brought you the decision of moving but like you know a lot of people live next to towers mm -hmm. and i mean i probably there's probably towers super close to where i live so like what can you do outside of moving to your environment to potentially mitigate some of these things or to i don't know i mean well, let's put it this way realistically are there things that you can do yes there are in the long term right like if you're saying I want to live in this house forever. Mm -hmm. I would just try to my best to discourage you from that, right? Because we don't know exactly how long it'll be mitigated for. Okay. Now, are there things you can do? Yeah, absolutely. You can make, you know, and again, we, I considered this rabbit hole, right? I, I loved my house. Yeah. Okay. Don't get me wrong. Like, I didn't just be like, oh, I'm selling the house. All right. Right. Like, <laughs> it was, it was a, probably like a, four month decision process in our family of like, are we selling the house or what are we doing? What's the reality of what we can do, et cetera, you know? Mm -hmm. And we found out that a lot of it is kind of BS, right? Like there, there, there are things like, oh, you can put this uh, 5G repeller thing on your phone and that's going to make it so that your cell phone doesn't get any electromagnetic fields on you. And you can put this in your windows and things of that. Like, 
all kinds of things. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And if it doesn't have a physics perspective, immediately you can throw it in the garbage. And by physics meaning, is it actively doing one of two things, shielding you or putting more distance between you and the emitter? Then don't, don't consider it. Now, when it comes to shielding, this is almost intuitive to test, right? Metal is going to be a great shielder. That's just why when you go inside a metal building, you lose cell phone reception pretty, pretty quickly. So if the exterior of your home is metal, you're going to have a completely different outcome, even though the next home next to you isn't metal and you both live the same distance from the cell phone tower. That's why people in that metal building might not experience much of anything versus people in a different building, right? So there's things of that nature. Um, grounding that building correctly and making sure that it's grounded correctly will also do that. The building materials that your building is made out of. Again, because... People know about this type of stuff. They're just not telling the public about it, right? When you go to an imaging center, like an x-ray imaging center, or an MRI imaging center, or any of those things, their walls are special. Their walls are lead-lined uh, drywall for that reason, so that people can walk around in there and not be affected by electromagnetic fields. A lot of times when you do get hit with like those rays or whatever, x-ray, they like walk out of the room. Yeah, they walk out. <laughs> they conveniently walk out of the room. You're still stuck in there. They're like, it's totally the safe, but I'm going to go in this uh, like bunker over yeah. here <laughs> and hit a button from you know, yeah, 50 yeah. feet away. Right. I mean, now, now, that is exaggerated radiation at that point because you are actively know that that's happening, right? But what if I dialed it down to like measurable but minute, but I never took it away. I never turned it off. Mm -hmm. Right, and that's what you're talking about when it comes to cell phones, 5G, cell phone towers, things of that nature, wireless communications like your Wi-Fi, things of that nature. They're actively so low that you're not going to feel anything right there, right? But how many people do you know that turn off their Wi-Fi at night? You know a few. Yeah. yeah. yeah I don't. A couple. Yeah, yeah probably. Yeah. yeah. I but, shut yeah. mine off on my own phone, but our Wi-Fi router's on. Mm -hmm. Correct. Right. Like, the, I'm talking your Wi-Fi router. Yeah. yeah. Right? It's an emitter, right? So it's always going to be emitting, right? Mm -hmm. Here's a simple hack. Buy a, a timer for lights. Plug your Wi-Fi router into it. Every time you go to bed, it turns off on its own. Every time you wake up, it's already on for you. You won't. My home security system. system. Everything is tied to the but, Wi-Fi but that, That's what I'm saying. Yeah. The, but now you got to understand that some people might not want you to turn it off, right? Mm -hmm. but again, I worked in an industry that's all automated and things of that nature. The things that you guys are kind of talking about, right? Home security, cameras, mm -hmm. that sort of stuff, right? Rule number one, always hide hardwire over wireless. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. that, in that industry, if you, wireless is last resort all the time because of this potential problem. Not with interfering with people, they could care less about that. It's about interfering with other wireless communication devices, right? Yeah. Your brain is a wireless communication device. Think about that, right? When you have a lot of wireless communication, external human-made things, they're going to mess with biological wireless communication things um, because the wireless communication shell that I have here in normal modern life, it's not grounded. If you're grounded, you kind of leverage yourself against having a better signal to noise ratio and things can interfere with you less, right? But that is one thing that, that is a simple hack is turning off your Wi-Fi router. But here's the thing. I find ways to just, with a cord, right? A, a 5G, uh, uh, Ethernet? Ethernet cord plugging in any wireless communication device that you need to have on, right? Your security system, camera, go a wired route. Then anything else, just have your Wi-Fi router turn off. That's a, like, now that I, I have a device that will, you know, a meter that will actively measure that from uh, a bio, uh, building biologist, that it's, it's significant, let's put it that way. Especially if you are right next to it, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's in that same bedroom. It's now, like you said, maybe I can't turn it off for whatever reason at this very moment. Then the next step would be to move it as far away from your sleeping area as possible. 
sleeping area is the most thing, the thing you need to focus on. Yeah. Right. Because that's when you're going to rest and recover and all of those things, your sleeping area. And you guys, you know, focus on it quite a bit with like, you know, recovery and your sleep aid bed and stuff like that. And just make it as dark as possible. Make it cool. Cooler, the better. But light isn't just the light you can see. It's light that your phones can let off. It's light that you're, you see what I'm saying? Like yeah. once you start to understand what light really is, then you start thinking, oh, okay, that now going that far, right? Like it can be as simple as maybe your Wi-Fi router is on this side of the house, right? And your bedroom has that wall over there. You There is some paints. There are paints. There are pain in the ass, but there are paints that are basically lead line paints, right? Like, you know, the old, like people mm -hmm. yeah. get rid of lead, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're bringing it back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not saying that, but there are some of those types of things that are uh, like lead light paints. They don't have lead in them, but they have a metal type reflective mm -hmm. material embedded into them, similar to that. They're not using lead, but they are very similar to what those lead based paints were. And you can literally paint that whole wall to be reflective in nature, especially from a Wi Fi router, right? But What's the other the paint called, is there a brand? <laughs> Um, if you go to safehome.com or something along those lines, I can't remember the brand. I, I tested so many things, like when I was doing this, like mm -hmm. paint, uh, shielding that you go in, that's almost like a tint for your windows, uh, all kinds of things of that nature. You had your home tested too to see mm -hmm. how much. Uh, yeah, yeah. And there is was it radiation. Is that my I mean, essentially, you want to call it that. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a form. Yeah, it's, it's a form of light. I just call it, you know, man-made light you know man-made light where it's it's a more accepting term because yeah it is a form of radiation it's called non-ionizing radiation but the earth has radiation as well Correct. naturally right mm -hmm. yeah. yeah so i i just call it something different so that people qu clearly distinguish it right like it's just man-made light mm -hmm. and, and your home had a lot of it yeah a lot of it um what was like, the impact of moving and how long did it take you to like start to feel better? So I started to feel better within the month of moving, but I didn't really feel like really good, like really good, like to the point where I'm like, yeah, I can start training again and I can start doing things again until, because we moved in April, right? So there wasn't a lot of strong sun where I come from, but the moment May and June started up and I spent all my days outside within three weeks, I was like, I'm bad. I'm, I'm, I feel good. Mm -hmm. I feel really good. And yeah, now that, that drive, we don't even have a house. Like we're just staying in somebody else's house, the other relative of ours. Right. You got me thinking, like you made me think of, uh, I don't know what it just popped in my head, but you said your wife's a nurse. So it made me think of like a hospital, mm -hmm. like what a horrible place to recover in. Yeah. <laughs> with all those lights and everything and mm, that, that, all you're the 100% electricity right. and everything flying around there. It's gotta be difficult. It's not, it's not a place to recover. It's a place to get treatment and a place to get out of there, if possible. But again, laws in this country don't really allow that. There is an actual medical freedom in this country, right? And that's actually a history lesson, in case people don't know. Right? Like our Bill of Rights uh, was influenced by lots of people. Somebody called, I think Benjamin Rush, I think is his name. He has an actual hospital somewhere back east that's the Rush Institution or something like that. And he was somebody that was in communication with the founding father, fathers. And, and one of the things that he wanted to add to the Bill of Rights was the ability to circumvent medical freedom or dictatorship from the government on what you can do medically. But that was 250 years ago. So they didn't really envision a world that the government could tell ubiquitously everybody what to do with their health. They just didn't think that that was a thing that might happen. So it never got put into the Bill of Rights. Unfortunate. Yeah. <laughs> Where can people find you? Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you driving out here. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah. Driving um, from Wyoming? Yeah. How far is that? Uh, a little over 10 hours. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, pleasant pleasant drive for you, yeah, you guys to get like away to, from the kids. Do right? you guys like to drive, you and your wife? or do you, Yeah, we, you we, we generally, yeah. Yeah, we like to drive. That's cool. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And... Uh, you know, time alone is never, never a bad time anyway. That's right. <laughs> especially, when, especially when you have kids. It's like, yeah, yeah, let's, let's go for, let's take 10 hours or th a few days away from them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Where can people find you? Um, so Instagram is really where I'm the most active as far as like 
information and that type of stuff, coaching, inquiries, all of that. David Herrera, 1119, at, uh, uh, that, that's my personal Instagram handle. And I have, you know, most of my bulk of my content there is like previous training, right? Like up until I stopped actually competing in powerlifting. Um, and then the rest of that is just podcast material that I put up, clips and stuff like that. Um, and that's really about it. How can people find your podcast? Um, so the podcast that I do is with Eurus, which is the other gentleman in there and it's on YouTube and any, any one of those, uh, cool. hosts will, will take you to the YouTube podcast. That's long format stuff, you know? Um, I love that. I listened to a couple of them. I'm kind of addicted. Yeah. I gotta listen to more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's tough to find, you know, um, I don't know. It's, I always find it interesting to find a kind of, to find these, uh, uh, folks that, uh, uh, aren't traditionally educated, Mm-hmm. You know, you went and you formed your own education, your own way. And um, I like getting science and information from all different kinds of people. It's cool to hear it from Andy Galpin and Andrew Huberman and those kinds of people. But it's also cool to hear it from people that kind of had to discover it on their own. Mm-hmm. Uh, otherwise, uh, their life was in jeopardy or, or somebody that they know their life was in jeopardy. I always find that to be really super interesting. It kind of reminds me of like the making of a superhero. Yeah, so, yeah, awesome yeah. work, and, and I really I, appreciate. I have it. one more Instagram, which is where I post most of the science of the things that we talked about. A lot of it won't make sense, but there is also like flat out twenty minute little video of like what does this actually all mean? Right, mm-hmm. you can go to the landing page. That's the Solar Athlete That's on Instagram. Awesome. Yeah, that that one really dives deep into cellular biology, how the mitochondria work all the different environmental inputs much more granularly as far as like trying to teach you physics on Instagram, <laughs> right? Like that's, that's oh, all I'm going to make an Instagram that you can't understand as well. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. <laughs> exactly. Right. And I don't so, know what topic I'll come up with though. Cause it seems like you know a lot about a lot of different things. Uh, and, and yeah. And then in there, there's a, there's a landing page in the bio that will take you to like, Hey, here's a little video. Here's like, six or seven videos and I just break down things that commonly are coming up, right? Like, Hey, you have thyroid problems or Hey, you know, you, maybe you don't know any of this stuff and you just want to, you know, kind of like what we elucidated today. Hey, what, what are the basics that I got to get down? Not necessarily like forever as far as, you know, I got to make time for cold exposure. I got to make time for, you know, cause that's the thing that will, people will run into. So there are hacks for this, right? Like maybe you're just a really busy person, but you commute roll down your damn window. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like I'm like real, like people just aren't creative enough. They just aren't creative enough in finding unique solutions to their particular problem. Right. So those were, those videos are more about that. The videos themselves don't go a lot into the science. That's the posts and stuff like that. Kind of showing you, you know, the actual things that you can go research yourself and stuff like that. But the, the videos are more of like practical hands on type of scenarios that I've come up with, with, with clients that live in Norway, for example, right? they got five hours of Mm. light at certain times of the year or, and then at other times of the year, it's full on day all the time, right? Like how, how do you navigate certain circumstances or people that literally work indoors all the time, right? Like start there. And then there will be, I'll I'll make more of them, but it's just, there's so many, like you you probably found out, there's so many different environmental inputs Mm -hmm. that all of a sudden dictate the outcome. And that's where, that, that's, that's where, you know, a consultation would just be better to really kind of understand that. But the videos are meant to be able to be digested very quickly, very easily, and know what to do next if your particular problem is sunlight or your particular problem is cold exposure or your particular problem is a thyroid problem, right? Like a thyroid problem, you know, depending on what your labs say, very quick inputs or even a sex hormone problem, like especially if you're a female, like low DHEA, low testosterone, some quick environmental inputs that you can follow for like eight weeks. You can retest it yourself and find out if it worked or not. Like mm. pretty, pretty quick. And the multiverse? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> strength is never a weakness. Weakness is never a strength. Catch you guys later. Bye. We'll get to the multiverse next time. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, man. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you guys enjoyed this episode, David, check out this episode with the Deal Con where we talked about reversing your biological age, how to 
was it reduce myostatin, which pretty much means gain more muscle and making your dick work better. There's a <laughs> lot of cool stuff in this episode. It's pretty wild. It's pretty advanced. So check it out. 